The new submarine alliance between the United States, the UK, and Australia could be the most aggressive and devastating move against China that has ever been conceived. As the West tries to maintain dominance around the world, these three nations have decided to take things to another level. We're going to tell you why an ally and member of NATO was stabbed in the back, how the United States exploited a loophole in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and whether this new nuclear sub-agreement could spark World War III. On March 13, 2023, President Biden of the United States, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese of Australia, and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak of the United Kingdom spoke at Point Loma Naval Base in San Diego. It was here that one of China's worst nightmares manifested. The three nations laid out plans to deliver nuclear-powered submarines to Australia in the coming years. This obviously worries China because it would threaten its position in the Indo-Pacific region of the world and have dire consequences for any future plans. However, China is not the only country that's unhappy with what's become known as the AUKUS Alliance. AUKUS gets its name from the abbreviations for Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Surprisingly, a member of NATO and an ally of all three nations was taken advantage of when the deal occurred. Could AUKUS tear apart long-lasting ties between Western powers, leaving China in a unique position to extend its influence? Let's find out. In March of 2021, Australian Navy Chief Vice Admiral Michael Noonan met in London with Admiral Tony Radican of Britain. The meeting was kept relatively quiet as Noonan would be asking the British military for a powerful and highly controversial vessel. It was during this meeting that talks began about arming the Australian Navy with nuclear-powered submarines. It's important to note that Australia was not looking for submarines armed with nuclear weapons, but for submarines powered by nuclear reactors to replace the diesel vessels they currently use. We'll come back to why this distinction needs to be made and why this is a huge deal to China. However, for now, it's important to know that when Vice Admiral Noonan and Admiral Radican met, this is what they discussed. It was later discovered that Australia and the United Kingdom both met with the U.S. military leaders the month before to talk about the possibility of a military pact that would improve Australia's naval capabilities. Then, at the G7 summit in June of 2021 in Cornwall, England, President Biden and then Prime Ministers Boris Johnson of Britain and Prime Minister Mr. Scott Morrison of Australia met to discuss the alliance further. Eventually, the meetings turned into an actual deal. It was agreed that both the US and UK would aid Australia in modernizing its submarine fleet. This would be a long process, but in the meantime, the US agreed to loan out some of their own nuclear-powered subs for training and military exercises to help prepare Australian sailors for their future vessels. The AUKUS agreement would evolve a few more times, culminating in the most recent update given by the leaders of all three nations in March of 2023. The initial AUKUS meetings were done in secret without the knowledge of the rest of the world, even though Australia had already had a previous deal with another country to build submarines. There is much more to this story, and the betrayal inflicted by these three nations will become clear later on. But first, let's look at why Australia having nuclear-powered subs has China on edge. Reason 1. Western military power in the Indo-Pacific will increase. In his most recent speech with the leaders of the UK and Australia by his side, President Biden stated, the United States has safeguarded stability in the Indo-Pacific for decades, to the enormous benefits of nations throughout the region, from ASEAN to Pacific Islanders to the People's Republic of China. This is one of China's main concerns. They already dislike the alliances the US has built in Asia, especially with South Korea and Japan, and they most certainly don't want to see that influence grow. Therefore, Australia becoming closer to the US and modernizing its navy, strengthening Western military capabilities in the region, is a serious cause for concern. China has been complaining for decades that Western expansion in their part of the world has been unacceptable and a threat to their national security. If Australia acquires nuclear-powered submarines, it could carry out more comprehensive intelligence gathering and reconnaissance missions. Their subs would be stealthier and could enter Chinese-controlled waters undetected. And in a worst-case scenario for China, these new subs could make their own naval ships obsolete. Currently, China has the largest navy in the world. However, having more ships than everyone else does not necessarily mean their navy is stronger. This is especially true if China's vessels are technologically inferior to their adversary. It's estimated that China has around 730 vessels in its navy. Nevertheless, many of these ships are old and run on obsolete technology. The nuclear-powered submarines that the US and UK are planning to equip Australia with will be able to outmaneuver, outgun, and outperform almost every naval vessel in the Chinese fleet. This is obviously one of the biggest concerns for China. It's not so much that the Australian Navy is growing, it's the fact that the Chinese forces won't be able to compete with the new subs developed by AUKUS unless they pour vast amounts of resources and time into modernizing their own naval vessels. And although the nuclear-powered subs that Australia will receive don't have nuclear weapons, they will be equipped with torpedoes and cruise missiles which could devastate Chinese forces in an armed conflict. 
Reason 2, Western powers will have more control over waterways in the region. During the same speech, President Biden also said our leadership in the Pacific has been to the benefit of the entire world. We've kept sea lanes and skies open and navigable for all. We've upheld basic rules of the road. He's referring to how the navies of the U.S. and its allies ensure that ships from all parts of the world can pass through the Indian and Pacific Oceans without being threatened. This statement is loaded, especially when it comes to China's point of view. Although AUKUS claims that the nuclear-powered submarines will guarantee the shipping lanes remain safe for all vessels, China has a hard time believing that Western powers have everyone's best interest at heart. Instead, China sees U.S. Navy ships in the Indo-Pacific region as encroachment by the West, and they aren't wrong. The new nuclear-powered subs would most certainly allow Australia to police the waters in their part of the world more efficiently and may even provide trade vessels with more protection from pirates and bad actors. However, it would also mean that the Chinese merchant and fishing vessels could be watched a little more closely, not to mention that Australia would be able to monitor Chinese naval movements more efficiently, which would then be shared with their allies like the United States. China does pretty much whatever it wants in the Pacific and Indian Oceans because they are the most powerful country in the region. China claims that it too makes sure shipping lanes are secured for all vessels, but it obviously has its own ship's best interests in mind. This includes hauling illegal goods across the planet or fishing where they aren't supposed to. Nuclear-powered submarines will allow Australia to have a more dominant presence in the region's waters and could threaten the way China currently does its business. There's also the fact that whoever controls the waterways can more easily enforce sanctions and trade agreements. If in the future Western powers need to place economic sanctions on China or restrict the movement of goods to and from the country for whatever reason, Australia's nuclear-powered submarines will make this process much easier. The AUKUS agreement is poised to increase Western control of the Indo-Pacific waterways, which China will not allow to happen as it has continuously stated. This has been made abundantly clear through the expansion of Chinese bases in Myanmar and further west in Djibouti. The main reason they are doing this is to protect their own shipping lanes from any type of U.S. blockade. And if Australia gets nuclear-powered submarines, China may need to build more bases to offset an increased Western presence near their most important trade routes. It cannot be understated how important controlling the waterways in the region is for both sides. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development estimates that around 80% of global trade is transported by sea. And an even more astounding statistic is that 60% of total maritime trade passes through the Indo-Pacific region and into the South China Sea. Literally trillions of dollars in trade pass between the Indian and Pacific Oceans as Chinese goods travel west to South Asia, Africa, and Europe. And at that same time, resources such as natural gas and oil are carried east to fuel China's economy and military. Whoever controls these waterways controls this part of the world. Reason 3 the nuclear-powered submarines will threaten China's very way of life. China constantly warns that the encroachment of the West toward Chinese borders will not be accepted. To be fair, Western powers, particularly the United States, have formed partnerships in the Pacific and Asia to keep China in check and increase its influence in the region. The morality and ethics of indoctrinating other parts of the world into Western ideologies can be debated, and there are definitely negative consequences to the U.S. establishing military bases around the world. But for China, this is a matter of life and death. The Chinese government is an authoritarian regime that controls everything within the country. Like other powerful nations around the world, they want to spread their influence and continue to grow the country's wealth and prosperity. However, this tends to be done through brutal crackdowns against anyone who speaks out against them and threatening retaliation if other governments oppose them. The Chinese government does not care who gets hurt as long as they can continue to grow their economy, spread their influence, and do it all their way. The spread of Western ideology and democracy threatens China's authoritarian framework with which it rules its people and interacts with the rest of the world. The same can be said about Russia and any other authoritarian rulers. Whether democracy, socialism, communism, or another form of government is the best for people can be debated. What can't be debated is that Western democracies and authoritarian rulers will never mix. Australia procuring nuclear-powered submarines and growing its ties to the United States is just another step toward the West boxing China in and preventing it from spreading its influence worldwide. Beijing has also claimed that the AUKUS alliance has created a Cold War mentality and zero-sum games, where China will have to strengthen its own position and respond with aggressive tactics to maintain the status quo. After the speech by the three leaders of AUKUS, the Chinese foreign ministry released a statement. The three countries have completely ignored the concerns of the international community and gone further down a wrong and dangerous road. 
This is one of their go-to arguments when it comes to Western influence spreading in Asia and the Indo-Pacific. China claims it's a matter of international security and that the West should not force its ideologies on other nations. However, when it comes to gray zone tactics and using its economic strength to influence other countries into doing what they want, China is usually pretty adamant that what they're doing is fine. So there's definitely a double standard there. The Chinese President Xi Jinping even said that the new AUKUS deal was leading to the all-round containment, encirclement, and suppression against China. The question then becomes, are the nuclear-powered submarines going to be used by Australia to contain China and suppress its expansion even further? We'd be lying if we didn't admit this would be at least part of the responsibility of the Australian nuclear-powered subfleet. It's unlikely these vessels would be used to attack Chinese ships or assets unprovoked, but they definitely will play some sort of part in keeping China in check. So, we know why China feels threatened by the nuclear-powered subs that the US, the UK, and Australia will be working on, and if all goes according to plan, the AUKUS alliance will strengthen the position of Western powers in the region. Would this be enough to cause China to attack Australia and plunge the planet into World War III? Only time will tell, but that seems unlikely. However, what is not unlikely is the continuing displeasure of one European country that was stabbed in the back by the AUKUS deal. France might hate AUKUS just as much as China. Could this mean that France might become closer to China? Let's find out. In order to understand why France is so upset about the nuclear-powered sub deal between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the US, we need to go back to 2009. The Royal Australian Navy desperately needed to update its submarine fleet, which consisted of six Collins-class vessels. These subs were built in the 80s and are diesel-powered. A Collins-class sub can reach speeds of 10 knots or about 12 miles per hour on the surface or at periscope depth, and 20 knots or 23 miles per hour when submerged. They have a range of around 13,200 miles on the surface, but only 550 miles when submerged and can operate for about 70 days at a time. These older Australian subs have a test depth of around 590 feet or 180 meters, but their actual operating depth is probably much deeper, although this information is classified. Collins-class subs have six torpedo tubes with a mix of 22 Mark 48 Mod 7 torpedoes and UGM 84C Harpoon anti-ship missiles. These subs were formidable 40 years ago, but naval tech has come a long way since then, and Australia knew it needed to upgrade its fleet if it had any hope of controlling the waterways around the nation. And this is why the military decided it was time to build new submarines. And although nuclear-powered subs are the way of the future, Australia ruled them out for a few reasons, the biggest of which was that Australia does not use nuclear power or have any nuclear weapons, and therefore, due to the International Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, it technically should not be able to obtain nuclear reactors. However, as we know, this didn't stop the AUKUS. For several years, Australian military officials and diplomats discussed possible deals with foreign countries to build a new class of submarine. They wanted something that could not only protect their waters, but ensure that Australia could control shipping lanes and conduct intel gathering missions in the region. In 2016, the Australian and French governments came to an agreement, and Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull signed a 31 billion euro deal with the Naval Group, a company that's mostly owned by the French government. The Naval Group worked with the Australian military to design a new type of sub, which they named Attack Class. This agreement became known as the Future Submarine Program. The idea was that the Attack Class submarines would be designed using the French nuclear-powered Barracuda Class subs as a template, but would be fitted with traditional propulsion systems instead of a nuclear reactor to maintain compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The attack class subs were also supposed to incorporate US Navy combat systems and torpedoes designed by Lockheed Martin Australia. The Australian government also required that at least part of every military vessel be built in Australia to create jobs. This increased the cost of constructing the attack class subs. However, even though the vessel would contain certain parts from multiple countries and be built partially in Australia, France benefited greatly from the contract. By 2019, the first round of designs was pretty much finished, and Australia agreed to a strategic partnership with Naval Group to build 12 submarines. But like with almost every military contract, there were massive delays and unforeseen costs. The money needed to build the attack class subs kept growing and growing. Before Australia and France were even ready to start assembling the vessels, the cost of the project rose to 56 billion euros, almost double what the initial contract was for. Negotiations continued for months, and in February of 2021, the initial plans were deemed too expensive and were scrapped. 
The Australian government gave Naval Group seven months to revise their plans and present new ones that would reduce the cost of the project. Obviously, at this point, tensions were high between all parties involved, so much so that Australia put contingency plans in place in case the project with France failed. And when Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison met French President Emmanuel Macron in Paris during the summer of 2021, both voiced their concerns over the submarine debacle. Although Macron did reassure Morrison that France would do everything it could to guarantee the success of the submarine contract. To reaffirm their commitment, France and Australia released a joint statement saying that the foreign and defense ministers knew the importance of the future submarine program and would continue to push forward. However, it appeared not everyone was on the same page because less than three weeks later Australia would abruptly call off the deal. On September 16, 2021, the Australian government released a public statement cancelling the deal with France, and the attack class submarine was dead in the water. They had already spent around 1.5 billion euros on the project, and it was likely that Australia would need to pay hundreds of millions more in penalties for prematurely cancelling the contract. However, the benefits appeared to outweigh the costs. The French were outraged by the sudden and public collapse of their deal with Australia. But what happened next would enrage and embarrass France, driving them to publicly denounce the new alliance that had formed. What Prime Minister Morrison claimed Australia needed sent shockwaves across the world. He stated that his country could no longer be effective at maintaining open trade routes and protecting the region without nuclear submarines. The speed, carrying capacity, and stealthiness of these vessels were vital to safeguarding the interests of Australia and the rest of the free world. Soon after the cancellation of the contract with France, AUKUS was announced. It was at this point that China started to voice its displeasure. Australia building new diesel-powered subs with France wasn't a big deal. However, if they procured nuclear-powered submarines from the United States, it would be a huge cause for concern. Let's now fast forward to the G7 summit that we mentioned earlier. Biden, Johnson, and Morrison met behind closed doors and in secret. They made it a point to not inform France of the dealings that were going on behind the scenes. This was possible due to the recent departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union post-Brexit. If Britain hadn't left the EU, these talks would not have been possible, at least not with the UK involved as it would breach at least some of the trade and foreign relation laws established to maintain the cooperative nature of the European Union. When the U.S. was brought into the conversation, Biden made it clear that there was no guarantee the U.S. would enter an agreement. Also, the Biden administration needed assurance that Australia ending the deal with France was not a ploy to have the U.S. step in and take over. Morrison reassured the U.S. president that this was not the case, as the Australian government had been considering alternatives to the attack class submarine deal for over 18 months. AUKUS started under the guise of a joint capabilities and interoperability agreement, although when the new alliance was explained further, it was shown to include improving cyber capabilities, artificial intelligence, quantum technologies, and additional undersea capabilities. The undersea capabilities are likely the part that caught France's attention. However, everything else on the list was bad news for China, which is why when AUKUS was announced, it wasn't just France that was voicing its discontent. China was right there with them. Let's take a closer look at the other components of AUKUS before coming back to the nuclear powered submarines that resulted from the deal and why China, along with many other nations, including NATO members, are concerned. The AUKUS Pact includes provisions for all three countries to work together and develop hypersonic missiles and defense against them. If we're to believe reports coming out of China, they are light years ahead of the US and the rest of NATO in hypersonic technology. And since it's believed hypersonic missiles will be one of the most important weapons in the future of warfare, this is bad news for the West. These missiles travel five times faster than the speed of sound, are incredibly hard to intercept, and can cause massive amounts of damage. It's unlikely that China has a large number of operational hypersonic missiles, but the US and its allies need to expand research efforts if they're going to keep from falling behind. China is not a fan of any agreements to increase the military capabilities of Western power, so they're adamant that many parts of the AUKUS deal are warmongering actions against their well-being. This also goes for the increased information sharing that the AUKUS deal will generate between the three nations. However, it's the nuclear-powered submarines that China is the most upset about. Anything that will threaten their dominance of the Indo-Pacific waterways in the region is a cause for their concern. Again, it can't be understated how important these maritime routes are for global trade and the movement of military assets for China. They need to be able to counter any Western blockades that could be implemented in the future, and the only way to do that is through controlling key waterways in the region. Any vessels, especially nuclear-powered submarines, that may threaten China's ability to move freely in the Pacific and Indian Oceans will not be tolerated. Now, before we move into the discussion around exactly what the nuclear-powered subs will look like and the specific military repercussions they can have on China, let's jump back to France real quick and see if the AUKUS deal is enough to drive them into the arms of the West's most powerful enemy. 
During the AUKUS deal, it was reported that the only other country mentioned in the discussion was France. However, there was no apology offered. France lost billions of euros when the future submarine program abruptly ended. This obviously angered the French government, but there's no chance that France will ever join China just because its pride was hurt. Franco-Chinese relations extend about as far as most European countries. France most definitely buys goods and tech from China like the rest of the world, but they're not about to become allies because of AUKUS. France is still part of NATO and the EU. Losing a submarine contract definitely won't change that. So, even though there was betrayal by some of the closest allies, France will maintain close ties with the US, Australia, and Britain. So what is it exactly about the nuclear-powered subs that Australia will be getting that has China so upset? After all, there will be no nuclear weapons aboard these subs. Do they really pose that much of a threat? Under the agreement, the United States will be sharing its nuclear propulsion tech with Australia. The United Kingdom has had a similar agreement with the US since 1958, when the US-UK Mutual Defense Agreement was formed. So their submarines already operate using this technology. The new submarines being designed to replace the Collins-class vessels will likely be similar to the Virginia-class submarines that the US is currently transitioning to. This means we can expect the new Australian subs to have a few key features and specifications. The reactors aboard the new submarines will likely be an S9G nuclear reactor, generating 280,000 horsepower or about 210 megawatts of energy. This reactor will be connected to steam turbines and a single shaft pump jet propulsor that will allow the sub to travel around 30 miles per hour. This is faster than the current Australian subs, but the nuclear reactor has another huge advantage over diesel-powered submarines. The nuclear reactors aboard US subs can produce enough energy to power the vessel non-stop for decades. Basically, the nuclear reactor will allow Australian submarines to travel underwater for any amount of distance and time. The only thing that limits its capabilities is the need to stop to resupply the crew and routine maintenance. Knowing this, it's not hard to see why this new class of Australian submarines poses such a threat to China. Refueling isn't a concern for these new subs when conducting missions or patrolling waterways, which puts any conventional Chinese vessels at a disadvantage. These new subs will also likely have a test depth of at least 800 feet, but will be able to go much deeper if needed. We don't know exactly what type of armaments the new nuclear-powered submarines will have, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that the vessels will contain a complement similar to the Virginia-class subs, minus the nuclear ballistic missiles. This means the Australian subs could have VLS anti-ship missiles or even Tomahawk long-range missiles for strikes against land targets. There will also probably be at least four torpedo tubes, and the vessel will be able to carry many more missiles and torpedoes than the Collins-class subs. When all is said and done, the nuclear-powered submarines that AUKUS is developing will pose a huge military threat to China. There's no doubt that having these vessels patrolling Indo-Pacific waters is something that Beijing wants to avoid at all costs, but there is still time before these submarines will be built and launched, which is good news for China. What isn't such good news is that during the transition period between phasing out the Collins-class subs and the new nuclear-powered vessels, the United States and the UK will deploy their own nuclear-powered submarines to the region to allow Australian soldiers to learn how to work work the systems and engineers to work with the nuclear reactors. The United States likely jumped at the opportunity to deploy nuclear-powered subs to the region. The AUKUS agreement gives them a non-aggressive reason to deploy more vessels in the Indo-Pacific, since it's all being done for training Australia. In reality, having more US and UK submarines in the region will only strengthen the West's position, which is a huge problem for China. All three nations deny that suppressing China through an increased naval presence had anything to do with the AUKUS deal, but it's hard to deny that more US and UK subs in the Indian and Pacific waters isn't an enticing part of the plan. As it stands right now, only six countries have nuclear-powered submarines. There are China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, the United States, and India. So Australia would only be the seventh nation in the entire world to have nuclear-powered underwater vessels. There are a few reasons why so few countries have nuclear-powered ships, but one of them is access to the necessary materials. In order for a country to produce nuclear reactors that can power submarines and ships, it needs to have facilities to generate nuclear fuel. Unfortunately, any nation that has the ability to do this also has the foundation for creating nuclear weapons. This is when the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty comes into play. For the safety of the planet, it's better if we don't increase the number of nuclear weapons already in existence. Therefore, limitations are put on who can generate nuclear materials, how much can be made, and what it can be used for. But not everyone follows the rules, and much to the chagrin of China and many other countries around the world, AUKUS has found a way around the rules. Before we get into how the AUKUS countries exploited a loophole to allow Australia to acquire nuclear-powered submarines, let's see where the agreement stands. The United States said that sharing its nuclear propulsion technology is a one-off event. 
and it's been reported that South Korea, which is closely allied with the U.S., also has ambitions to obtain nuclear-powered submarines, but the U.S. refused this request in 2020, citing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So it is a bit strange that the U.S. is willing to breach that very treaty to supply Australia with nuclear subs. China has called out the U.S. on their breach of the treaty and has rightfully stated, like many other nations, that the actions of the AUKUS could jeopardize the planet's safety. On August 31, 2022, the UK agreed to send the HMS Anson S-123, an astute class nuclear-powered submarine, to Australia in order for their submariners to begin training. On March 8, 2023, the United States announced that Australia would buy three Virginia-class nuclear submarines with the option of purchasing two more in the future. The US stated that the acquisition of these subs would fulfill an important transitional period as Collins-class subs are phased out. However, there's still a long-term plan to design a new Australian submarine that would be built in conjunction with the US and Britain. Now China is facing a huge dilemma. The US seems to be willing to break international norms to help Australia become more dominant in the region. The fact that both the US and the UK will be sending nuclear-powered subs to the region in the near future is bad news for China even if they're only for training purposes. That, along with the fact that Australia will procure three Virginia-class subs in the coming decade, means that China's timeline for a response has become greatly reduced. It's highly likely that China is looking for ways to offset the nuclear-powered vessels that Australia is acquiring, and this could be very bad news for everyone. The argument becomes, if the United States and Britain can break the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, why can't China? What is stopping them from exploiting the same loophole in arming Myanmar, Pakistan, North Korea, or any other authoritarian regime with nuclear-powered submarines? Let's look a little bit closer at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and see how exactly the US and the UK got around it and how China could do the same thing in the future. The main purpose of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is to control the amount of nuclear fuel produced, whether for weapons or nuclear reactors in general. However, a provision allows the non-nuclear weapon states, such as Australia, to produce highly enriched uranium for use in naval ship reactors. This is part of the agreement that the United States and the United Kingdom used to justify delivering nuclear-powered submarines to Australia. Australia. The problem is that this part of the treaty is generally agreed to be for surface ships, not submarines. The reason for this is that the International Atomic Energy Agency, also known as IAEA, which is the organization that monitors nuclear fuel production and compliance, can't easily inspect and safeguard reactors on submarines for obvious reasons. There's no such thing as a surprise inspection on a submarine whose location is classified deep under the waters of the ocean. No one believes that Australia will siphon off nuclear fuel from their submarine reactors to build nuclear weapons, but the same can't be said for every country. A perfect example of this happened in 2018. Iran informed IAEA that it was planning to build its own naval nuclear propulsion system in the future. This gave them the pretext to remove some of their nuclear materials from the safeguards put in place by the IAEA. They then could use this material to create their own naval nuclear reactor for ships or use the fuel for more nefarious purposes. Iran has yet to remove any of their nuclear material from safeguards, which was likely due to pressure from both Russia and China, who don't want to elicit a response from Western nations. What the AUKUS agreement does is set the precedent for removing nuclear materials from safeguards in the future. If a nation wanted access to nuclear-powered submarines or just nuclear materials in general, it could cite the AUKUS agreement to the International Atomic Energy Agency for doing so. Technically, since submarines are naval vessels, what the US, UK, and Australia are doing is not breaching the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. However, it does set a dangerous precedent, which China has been very vocal about. They're not the only ones. Many leaders around the world are nervous about what this agreement could mean in the future and the damage it could do to the non-proliferation of nuclear materials. To be fair, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty doesn't do much to prevent the use of nuclear material to create weapons. For one thing, a perpetrator would need to be caught first. Also, so there are no actual consequences for non-compliance. Any nation that's in violation of the treaty is referred to the UN Security Council, which then decides what to do. But since the members of this council are China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, there is very little agreement about what should be done if someone breaks the treaty. This means it falls to the international community to condemn countries that take advantage of the IAEA and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. However, when the parties in question are the United States and the United Kingdom, it's difficult for other nations to stand up to their decisions. The US is the only superpower in the world, and with that title has massive influence over many countries. It's unlikely that anyone in NATO, except perhaps France, will fully condemn the AUKUS deal. However, if China were to do the same thing, there might be some repercussions. These would probably come in the form of sanctions, but as things stand now, it's not clear how far the West would be willing to go to punish China for doing something that the US and UK have already done. 
Like China is currently doing, the United States and its allies would likely voice their displeasure with nuclear materials being shared. But it's hard to argue against something like delivering nuclear reactors to a country without nuclear capabilities when you've done the same exact thing. It's this double standard that has the whole world on edge. China is currently in a unique position to have its complaints heard since they have the second largest economy and military after the US. However, the stronger US allies get through things like the AUKUS deal, the more difficult it'll be for China to spread its power and influence in the future. China's most powerful ally is Russia, and we know how they are not nearly as strong as Putin claims. Therefore, China might be looking to build alliances with other nations that could offer strategic bases in the Indo-Pacific region. This is why China has been building alliances with many nations in Asia and Africa. But arming countries that could support China in the future is a dangerous proposition. It can also take time, which due to the AUKUS agreement China might be running out of. In the years to come, AUKUS may be the catalyst for increased tension in Indo-Pacific waters as China tries to strengthen its position. It's not clear what steps they'll take, but new talks between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin may indicate that there will be a renewed push to combat the encroachment of Western ideologies and influence into the realms that China intends to control. The nuclear submarines that will be delivered to Australia will likely only further increase tensions between China and the West. However, how far China is willing to go is not yet clear. They are undoubtedly scared that these new subs will allow the West to blockade their ports and control shipping lanes more easily. Could World War III be started over a nuclear-powered submarine agreement? Unfortunately for us all, it's not out of the realm of possibility. The exploitation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty by the US and UK is a dangerous thing. China's main concerns are for its well-being, just like every other nation around the world. Of course, they are more powerful than most, and they have an enormous amount of influence in certain parts of the world because of their economic might. However, this could all be put in jeopardy if Australia uses its nuclear-powered submarines to police the Indian Pacific Seas. If this is a move to monitor and regulate China's trade routes, it could lead to a very real conflict in the future. Both the West and China claim their only goal for increasing their military strength in the region is to protect trading vessels and promote free movement in its waters. Yet it's quite evident that much more is at stake as nuclear-powered subs are deployed in the region. With 72 submarines in service, the United States fields the largest underwater fighting force in the world, stealthy and absolutely deadly against surface vessels. Submarines are tasked with deterring foreign aggression, nuclear deterrence, intelligence gathering, and even providing fire support for land forces with land attack missiles. But for the most of a submarine's lifespan, it will glide through the oceans of the world completely undetected and, as they say, out of sight, out of mind. What is life like under the sea for those who man these secretive weapons of war though. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographics Show. Today we're taking a look at what life is like aboard a submarine. Just a quick note about a sponsor of this video, Skillshare. You're about to learn how sailors spend 90 days or more at a time out at sea. But if that was you and you had Skillshare, you could spend that time learning brand new skills or honing existing ones. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 20,000 classes in photography, video production, management, and more. All available online right now. The first 1,000 people to sign up by visiting the link in the description will receive two months of Skillshare absolutely free. Join Skillshare and start learning today. Now, let's get back to the video. Not every man can be a submariner, and though it is a 100% all-volunteer force, the US Navy's submarine fleet has very stringent entry requirements. Individuals must be male, pass a series of academic tests, psychological evaluations, and intensive courses on the fundamentals of submarine operations. With deployments that can last for hundreds of days at a time, and disaster being only one mistake away, the Navy must be confident that it is entrusting some of the most expensive weapons in its arsenal, and the 100-plus lives within them to only the most psychologically stable and academically qualified individuals. But it isn't a life for everyone who applies. Technically, the US deploys submarines for about 90 days at a time. But the realities of a dynamic geopolitical environment sometimes means that submariners will be out at sea for a hundred days or more, pulling into port only long enough to stock up on food reserves before putting out to sea again. One submariner interviewed by Task and Purpose said that his longest deployment was for 
328 days. That's a long time spent inside a cramped metal tube underwater. As the US Navy only operates nuclear-powered submarines, each sub's endurance is based on the amount of food it can carry. The reactors will typically only be fueled once during the lifetime of a boat, and a need to keep its crew fed is the only thing that limits how long a submarine can stay out to sea for. Both air and water are regenerated internally, so even long after food runs out, a submarine will still provide fresh drinking water and breathable air. The submarine's crew is split up into three six-hour shifts each. Typically, a crew member will have six hours on duty, six hours of study, exercise, and private time, and six hours of sleeping time. This 18-hour day rotation can be disorienting for a crew who spends weeks at a time under the water, and typically crew members only know what time of day it actually is based off of what meal they are being served. Space is at an absolute premium on any submarine, so personal space is extremely limited. Every submariner has typically about 15 square feet to themselves, and sleep in tiny bunks affectionately or not called coffins. Inside your bunk, only a thin sheet of cloth separates you from the outside world, so privacy is nearly non-existent. And because somebody is always sleeping no matter the time of day, submariners have an unwritten rule to never slam doors and always keep volume down to a minimum. Some submarines Submariners, however, have more crew than bunk space, which leads to the much-hated practice of hot bunking, where two or more submariners share one bunk. As one prepares to start their shift, the other takes his place to get his six hours of sleep. Submarines, it seems, are definitely not places for anybody with privacy or personal space issues. Bunks aren't the only place with limited space. There's typically only two showers for the entire crew of up to 130 submariners, and a maximum showering time of three to five minutes is enforced. This not only helps ensure everyone who needs one can get a shower, but it also lessens the strain on the ship's water filtration system, which turns salty seawater into fresh water. There's also typically only a single dryer and washer aboard a submarine, making clean laundry a luxury. For entertainment, there is a tiny gym with typically one to two machines and free weights, which the crew can use. Because space is at such a premium, rooms typically have double uses and the gym may in fact be the torpedo room. The officer's wardroom, where senior officers officers dine, also serves as an operating theater during medical emergencies. Bathrooms are extremely limited as well, with typically only one bathroom per 40 men. And you'd better know how to use the toilet, because waste has to be held in a special tank to be ejected at the appropriate time. The toilet has to be pressurized before you flush it, but operate it improperly and it will shoot its contents backwards into your face. A rec room typically offers a plasma TV or two, and a large selection of movies to keep the crew entertained. Video game systems are common along with a small library of games. Though the Navy makes cards and board games freely available to help sailors blow off steam and build camaraderie. The most space aboard a submarine is reserved for the nuclear reactor and the propulsion system, which alone take up about one-third of the sub's total length. The kitchen takes up the second most amount of space and is typically extremely well stocked, the US Navy knowing for decades that a well-fed crew is a happy crew. Life beneath the waves for weeks or even months at a time can be extremely stressful, and so the Navy makes sure its galleys are well stocked. Sailors can enjoy fresh ingredients for the first few weeks of deployment, though after that food is made from non-perishables. Even then though, chefs manage to whip up a variety of dishes from lasagna to lobster to prime rib, and a delicious dessert is always on hand. There is no internet aboard a submarine, and communication with the outside world is reserved for the rare instances that a sub surfaces. Because initiating communications can give away a sub's position, and stealth is the most valuable asset, submariners don't communicate much with the outside world. That means that submariners can go weeks or months without contact family or loved ones, and must rely on the friendships they've developed on board. To make the cramped environment more tolerable for each other, submariners have additional unwritten rules, such as no talk of politics on board, although sports trash talk is acceptable if not encouraged. While all of the military branches are keen on traditions and rites of passage, none are as dedicated to their traditions or have as nuanced rites of passage as the Navy. Partly tradition and partly to help keep morale up, submariners enjoy a tradition of initiating new crew members on their first crossing of the equator, called crossing the line. Everyone who has already crossed the line is known as a shellback, and those who haven't are known as wogs, shorthand for polywog.
polywogs. The polywogs must polish a set of red trash weights used to compact trash and then wear them around their necks for a week before the crossing. Wogs are also given an M&M, which they must keep and defend as their pearl, ensuring that it stays on their person at all times. Upon crossing the equator, the shellbacks spray the wogs with water hoses and dunk them in cold water which may or may not have been urinated in. Seamen are a strange sort. Then they are escorted to the ward room, where the fattest submariner on board has been dressed in a baby's diaper and covered in whipped cream, vinegar, mayonnaise, pretty much every condiment available. And then the wog must place their pearl inside his belly button and retrieve it back with their mouth. From that day on, the wog is no more and is welcomed as a full-blown shellback. Strange rituals aside, strong camaraderie is what sets submariners apart from other sailors in the US Navy. And when you're spending weeks at a time in a pressurized cylinder straining to hold back the weight of the ocean, it's understandable that you might need to let some steam off in some pretty creative ways. Because of the high stress of their jobs, submariners are often excused somewhat from the Navy's typical strict regulations on hair and facial hair, allowing short beards and longer than usual hair for the notoriously tightly clipped US Armed Forces. Once rejoining the rest of the Navy by pulling into port, however, submariners must get the trimmers out and make sure they're back in regs. Life aboard a submarine is tough, a unique mental and physical challenge that not every sailor is cut out for. Yet has been argued repeatedly by defense analysts across the US, the US Navy's silent service is the most critical element of its national security. From maintaining nuclear deterrence to ensuring the good behavior of not-so-friendly nations, by threatening swift and overwhelming retaliation. Submariners are the world's ultimate, if secretive, peacekeepers. The US Navy's submarine force is known as the Silent Service quiet, deadly, and utterly secretive. They represent everything that makes these weapons of war the most feared by sailors on the high seas. With nations around the world fielding submarines ranging in size from half of that of an aircraft carrier to barely the length of a school bus, these undersea terrors are as versatile as they are deadly. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographic Show. Today, we're taking a look at 50 incredible facts about the history, development, and deployment of submarines. 50. L. Ron Hubbard, founder of Scientology, served in the U.S. Navy during World War II and was briefly made a commander of the small submarine chaser USS PC-815, during which he claimed to have sunk two Japanese submarines off the coast of Oregon, though a subsequent investigation concluded there was no evidence of any subs in the area. One month later, he was relieved of duty for shelling Mexican territory, and supervisors recommended he be assigned duty on a large vessel where he can be properly supervised. 49. In World War II, public weather reports were heavily censored to prevent enemy submarines lurking below the waves from learning about local conditions. A football game in Chicago was covered in fog so thick that the radio announcer couldn't see the field, but he was commended for never once using the word fog or mentioning the weather. 48. In April 1968, a Soviet strategic ballistic missile submarine, the K-129, sunk in the North Pacific Ocean, prompting a massive search by the Soviets. Clued in that the Soviets were likely missing a sub, the US reviewed recordings from their extensive underwater hydrophone network and located the location of the sub's implosion within days. 47. After weeks of a fruitless Soviet search for their missing submarine, the US dispatched their own submarine, the USS Halibut, to the wreck site during the classified Operation Sand Dollar. Using deep submergence search equipment, the Halibut spent several weeks taking over 20,000 close-up photos of the wreck of K-129. 46. Wanting to recover the Soviet wreck in order to pilfer its secrets, the CIA enlisted the aid of American billionaire and known eccentric Howard Hughes, who acted as a front for the construction and deployment of a specially built ship which would lower a claw to the seafloor and lift the destroyed sub to the surface. 45. Under the pretense of mining manganese nodules from the ocean floor, the Glomar Explorer then set off to the location of the wreck and succeeded in lifting up a portion of the forward hull, recovering two nuclear torpedoes, sonar equipment, code books, and the bodies of six Soviet sailors. 44. The CIA considers the recovery of Soviet submarine K-129 one of its greatest Cold War successes, and the bodies of the six Soviet submariners were given a burial at sea with full military honors by American seamen. Video of the burial ceremony was given to the Russian government in 1992 as a diplomatic gesture. 43. 
The only sinking of a submarine by another submarine while submerged occurred on February 9, 1945, when the Royal Navy submarine HMS Venturer scored a direct hit on the U-boat U-864 off the coast of Norway. 42. In total, nine nuclear submarines have been sunk around the world and most remain on the bottom of the ocean floor, with their nuclear weapons and reactors intact. 41. The Soviet nuclear submarine K-429 actually sank twice, once at sea from flooding during a test dive, and then after being raised, sinking two years later after flooding while moored. Raised once more, this unlucky sub was finally decommissioned two years later, no doubt to the great relief of her crew. 40. Only two submarine accidents have ever exceeded 100 onboard deaths, the sinking of the USS Thresher in 1963 and Russia's K-141 Kursk in 2000. 39. The sinking of the USS Thresher was the greatest loss of life from a submarine accident ever. After a pipe joint failed, water burst into the sub and shorted out electrical systems, leading to a loss of power. When the ballast tanks were blown to resurface manually, ice plugged the valves and prevented the sub from rising, causing the Thresher to implode at a depth of about 1,300 to 2,000 feet. 38. Second to the sinking of the Thresher, the sinking of the Russian Navy's Kursk killed 118 sailors. Faulty weldings and poor workmanship led to a leak of one of her practice torpedoes hydrogen peroxide fuel, which caused an explosion equivalent to 220 to 550 pounds of TNT. After settling at the bottom, a second explosion equivalent to 3 to 7 tons of TNT killed all but 23 of the remaining crew. The 23 survivors later died when their chemical oxygen generator created a flash fire, which consumed the remaining oxygen in the compartment they were sheltering in. 37. In May 2012, a dock worker wanting to get out of work early started a fire aboard the moored USS Miami, which consumed the forward section of the sub. The worker was sentenced to 17 years in prison and fined $400 million, which we're sure he promptly paid off. 36. During the Cold War, Finland developed two advanced submarines in cooperation with the Soviet Union. Fearful of advanced submarine technology making its way into Soviet hands, the US secretly threatened Finland with severe economic sanctions if it continued its partnership, which Finland promptly terminated. 35. Sound travels very easily through water, so submarines rely primarily on sonar to locate their prey. Experienced sonar operators are extremely valuable to any navy and have learned to identify different classes of ships by the sound of their engines and propellers. 34. Computers are even better at identifying ships by the sounds they make than humans, though, and the most advanced sonar systems can even identify individual vessels by the unique sounds they make due to their specific construction, variations in materials, and tiny flaws or imperfections in their engines or propellers. 33. In order to not give themselves away, submarines rarely engage their own sonar and instead sit quietly for hours or even days listening to the sound of the ocean around them until an enemy gives themselves away by turning on their own sonar or by the sound of their engines and propellers. 32. When actively looking for an enemy submarine, though, LFA sonar is the loudest man-made noise, reaching over 200 decibels. 31. The British HMS Artful is one of the greatest endurance submarines in the world and can stay underwater for 25 years at a time. Its onboard systems automatically produce oxygen and drinking water from seawater. 30. In case of global nuclear war, one of the ways the British nuclear submarine fleet checks to see if the British government is still functioning is to see whether BBC Radio 4 is still broadcasting or not. 29. During the 1960s, afraid that Soviet subs could sever undersea communications cables, which kept the US in contact with its overseas forces, the US deployed a ring of 480 million tiny copper antennas, the length of a stamp and twice the width of a human hair into space around the Earth. The antennas would help bounce radio signals around the world and thus ensure communications, but were ultimately made obsolete by the creation of the telecommunications satellite. 28. Each British nuclear ballistic submarine contains a sealed and unopened letter of last resort from the current Prime Minister, 
housed in a nested safe. The letters are handwritten instructions from the Prime Minister, which the captain of each sub is instructed to open only if the British government has been wiped out. The letters are destroyed after each new Prime Minister takes office and replaced with a new one. Only the British PM knows the content of the letters, but it's thought that they include commands for the captain to A. Retaliate with nuclear weapons B. Not to retaliate C. Use his or her own judgment or D. Place the submarine under command of the US or Australia. 27. Submarines are the stealthiest ships in the sea, so stealthy in fact that in 2009, two British and French nuclear submarines collided with one another because they couldn't detect each other. 26. After the end of World War I, a German submarine washed up onto a beach in Hastings, England. 25. On February 23, 1942, the Japanese submarine I-17 surfaced near Santa Barbara, California, and attempted to shell an aviation fuel facility with its deck gun. Doing little to no damage, the shelling helped prompt the internment of Japanese Americans for fear of enemy collaborators. 24. In 1998, a North Korean midget sub and her crew were lost when they became entangled in a South Korean fishing net. When fishermen notified the South Korean authorities, a South Korean ship secured the stranded submarine and began to tow it to port, only for the ship to be scuttled by the crewmen sealed inside, who then committed suicide. 23. Half of the United States' entire nuclear arsenal is stored aboard 14 ballistic missile submarines. 22. The third leg of the nuclear triad, after ICBMs and nuclear-capable bombers, submarines are the third element of modern nuclear deterrence. Because of their stealthiness and the ability to hide close to enemy shores, submarine-launched nuclear missiles are the most survivable element of the nuclear triad. 21. Each of the US's 14 Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines carries up to 20 nuclear missiles tipped with 8 100-kiloton nuclear warheads. 20. An Ohio-class Trident nuclear attack missile can independently target each of its eight warheads, striking eight targets per missile. Altogether, a single Ohio-class submarine can destroy 160 cities or military bases. 19. The maximum operating length for an Ohio-class submarine is classified and officially annotated as limited only by onboard food supplies. 18. The largest submarine ever built was the Soviet Union's Akula-class nuclear ballistic missile submarine with a length of 372 feet, a beam of 45 feet, and weighing up to 13,800 tons. 17. The Akula-class is one of the only submarines ever built with surface-to-air missiles as part of its weapons package. 16. The Indian Navy currently leases one Russian Akula-2 submarine the NERPA, under a lease program with an option to buy at the end of the lease. 15. In August 2009, two Akula-class submarines operated off the east coast of the United States, marking the first known Russian submarine deployment to the Western Atlantic since the end of the Cold War. 14. In August 2012, it was discovered that a Russian Akula-class submarine had operated in the Gulf of Mexico undetected for over a month sparking controversy within American military and political circles. 13. One American or Russian nuclear ballistic missile submarine has enough firepower on board to make it the sixth most powerful nuclear power in the world. 12. Unlike their ballistic missile cousins, attack submarines are known as hunter-killer submarines and specialize in anti-submarine warfare and targeting surface ships. Some even have cruise missile capabilities to strike land targets. 11. The first nuclear-powered submarine was the USS Nautilus, deployed in 1955. Three years later, the Soviets followed suit with their Project 627 Kit-class submarine. 10. On October 1981, a Soviet Whiskey-class submarine ran aground on the south coast of Sweden, prompting an incident known as Whiskey on the Rocks. 9. Near the end of World War II, a German sailor's inability to properly use the toilet led to the sinking of submarine U-1206 and the capture of her crew. 8. On Friday the 3rd, 1986, Soviet submarine K-219 suffered a catastrophic explosion in one of its missile tubes. As the captain struggled to save the ship, the nuclear reactor, which should have automatically shut down, failed to do so. 20-year-old Sergei Preminin volunteered to enter the reactor room and shut down the reactor manually, which he did. However, water pressure difference between his sealed compartment and the rest of the ship prevented the crew from opening the door, and Preminin asphyxiated inside the sealed compartment. 
he was posthumously awarded the Order of the Red Star for his bravery. 7. After the sinking of K-219, a Soviet research ship located the wreck and discovered that its entire complement of nuclear weapons was missing. To this day, their location is unknown. 6. During the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, American ships located a Soviet submarine near the coast of Cuba and dropped signaling depth charges meant to force the submarine to surface. Running too deep for radio communication and thinking that war may have already broken out above them, the three senior officers aboard voted to authorize launch of the sub's nuclear weapons in accordance with operating instructions. One officer, Vasily Arkhipov, was the single vote that prevented the unanimous decision required, and thus saved the entire world from nuclear Armageddon. 5. On January 25, 1995, a team of US and Norwegian scientists launched a four-stage sounding rocket off the northwestern coast of Norway, inadvertently following an air corridor which American ICBMs would use en route to Moscow. The rocket appeared on radar as a US Navy submarine-launched Trident missile. Fearing a high-altitude nuclear attack meant to cripple Russian radar in preparation for a full nuclear strike, Russia's nuclear forces went on full alert, and the Russian nuclear football was brought to the Russian president Boris Yeltsin, who had to decide whether or not to immediately launch a retaliatory nuclear strike against the United States. Thankfully for us, he did not. 4. Per U.S. Navy tradition, no U.S. submarine is ever considered lost if it fails to return. It and its crew are still considered to be on patrol. 3. During World War II, two New Zealand trawlers came across a Japanese submarine that outweighed them by a thousand tons. Refusing to back down, the two fishing vessels repeatedly rammed the much larger submarine until they beached it, allowing the U.S. to capture it and vital Japanese codebooks. 2. The U.S. Navy operates a secretive submarine base in a remote lake in northern Idaho where it develops stealth submarine technology far from prying eyes. It's believed that an underground waterway to the ocean allows it to secretly deploy submarines straight to the Pacific. 1. British submarines fly the Jolly Rogers to honor submarine tradition. Submarines haunt the dreams of sailors around the world. Secretive, stealthy, and able to strike from out of nowhere, they remain the greatest threat to surface ships. Thankfully, submarines are limited in just how fast they can move, typically with a top speed of 29 miles per hour, which is well short of a typical destroyer's top speed of 40 miles per hour. Lagging behind their potential prey, submarines must typically intercept their targets or lurk in sea lanes and wait for an enemy to stumble into them. But what if subs could move much, much faster than they currently do? Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographic Show. Today we're taking a look at supersonic submarines, the US Navy's new super weapon. Moving underwater can be more difficult and energy intensive than cruising along the surface, thanks to the huge amount of drag that water exerts on a vessel, and denser water a submarine encounters the deeper it dives. Thus, while speedboats can zip along the surface of the ocean at speeds of up to 90 miles per hour, anything traveling beneath the waves must exert exponentially larger amounts of energy to move as fast, something traditional submarines are incapable of doing. Yet, in June of this year, it was revealed that Chinese hackers had stolen sensitive data from a US contractor that had been working on a top-secret program to develop a supersonic missile to be launched from a submarine. While the data was only sensitive in nature and not classified, it did hint at a major avenue of research the US was undertaking, and hinted that the US Navy was not just interested in supersonic missiles, but supersonic submarines as well. For US-China observers though, the revelation was no surprise, as in 2014 China had made claims of huge technological breakthroughs in developing their own supersonic submarines. But just how can you move a submarine through the water at supersonic speeds without huge amounts of energy or absolutely destroying the ship in the first place? Let's take a look at both the US and China's approach to the problem. The US proposal involves doing something called supercavitation, a technology that the Soviet Union developed in the 1960s for superfast torpedoes. The Soviet approach to moving a torpedo at hundreds of kilometers an hour was to add a special segment to the nose cone of a torpedo filled with pressurized gas. That gas in turn is ejected at extremely high pressures and creates a bubble around the torpedo. A rocket motor rather than a traditional propeller then pushes the torpedo along, 
and since it's avoiding drag from the water, the torpedo could reach incredible speeds. The design was a success, but because of the need to maintain a gas bubble, the range of the torpedo was only a few miles. By scaling the technique up dramatically, the US hopes to cocoon an entire submarine in a gas bubble, and then use the powerful rocket motors to blast across the ocean at speeds faster than sound. The physics involved showed that the concept could work, and already does at smaller torpedo scales. Yet so far, the US has been unable to overcome several obstacles, one of those being the difficulty in maintaining the integrity of a large enough bubble around the submarine and keeping it from pulsating dangerously. During current smaller scale tests, the bubble tended to expand and contract to such extremes that parts of the submarine model made frequent contact with water. At extreme speeds, that would be disastrous and could rip a submarine apart, or at the very least create so much friction that the submarine would go wildly off course. To overcome the problem, scientists are experimenting with moderating the rate of gas release at the tip of the submarine. China's approach to the problem uses traditional supercavitation techniques, with a new technique that involves spraying a special liquid membrane onto the vessel's hull to reduce its friction with the water. The vessel would gradually speed up with this membrane being constantly sprayed on it as it was worn away. Once hitting about 62 miles per hour, an air bubble could be formed and maintained. China's solution would entail the use of a synthetic lubricant of sorts to help a vessel slip through the water. It also provides a possible fix to one of the biggest practical challenges facing supercavitating vessels. How do you steer it? Moving at such incredible speeds, if you were to extend a fin or control surface into the water, it would be immediately snapped off, and the force exerted might throw your submarine into a spin, which would lead to disaster. Yet by moderating the flow of their liquid membrane, the Chinese could ensure that one side of the submarine's bubble experiences slightly more drag than the other, which would allow a sub to turn, dive, or rise as it sped along at the speed of sound. If it truly works, it would be an elegant solution to one of the biggest practical hurdles facing this entire concept. Yet a supersonic submarine would not make for a very good offensive weapon, as submarines are in fact extremely vulnerable assets whose best defense is stealth. A submarine crossing the ocean at supersonic speeds may be able to get from San Francisco to Shanghai in 100 minutes, but it will generate so much noise that even a deaf sailor would hear it. That would make a supersonic sub extremely easy prey for surface anti-submarine ships or other hostile attack subs. That's why the technology will likely not be used for offensive purposes, but rather for logistical ones. Supersonic subs that could cross the Pacific in just over an hour would be ideal for quickly moving personnel and resources to conflict areas and would be incredibly appealing for the US which faces the prospect of coming to the aid of its NATO allies in Europe in case of war against Russia. For decades, Russia has counted on the fact that in the case of war, it might be able to force a ceasefire favorable to its interests by quickly overwhelming European defenders and then digging in before the bulk of US forces could arrive weeks later from America. Faced with the prospect of a difficult war against an entrenched enemy and the massive civilian casualties it would cause, NATO might be more inclined to simply acquiesce to part of Russia's demands rather than wage a very costly war. Yet a supersonic underwater transport vehicle could change all of that by giving the US the ability to move large amounts of personnel and equipment across the Atlantic in a matter of hours. That would make a US buildup possible in days rather than the weeks it would currently take to ship American attack helicopters and armor across the ocean. Such a fast transport system would also give US leaders a capability they have dreamt of for decades, the ability to put boots on the ground nearly anywhere in the world within hours. As one US military officer once noted, the ability to place a company of US infantry anywhere in the world within a few hours would stop a lot of wars before they started. Supersonic submarines could be revolutionary tools for any nation's navy, yet the technical challenges are formidable and it's unlikely that they'll be overcome anytime soon. Some worry that pilfering of US secrets by China may erode the US's military edge over its potential adversary, but the continued theft of low-level secrets by Chinese hackers merely points at a culture that is more adept at trying to steal revolutionary new technologies than to invent its own, something that would be of serious concern for Chinese military planners. Trapped at the bottom of the Barents Sea, distraught Russian Navy personnel are in a fight to survive as one catastrophe follows another on board their embattled submarine. Each of those men is faced with unimaginable terror. As time passes, the highest echelons of Russian officialdom will lie through their teeth and exhibit startling ineptitude. This will become one of the hardest periods in Vladimir Putin's entire life, and that's saying something. 
The story begins on August 10, 2000, when the Russian nuclear submarine K-141 Kursk was engaged in naval exercises in the Barents Sea. The Kursk belonged to the Oscar II-class submarine commissioned during the height of the Cold War, designed to take out large enemy ships or aircraft carriers. The Oscar II was powered by an OK-650 nuclear reactor, giving it 97,990 shipboard horsepower and a speed of up to 33 knots when fully submerged. On board, each sub carried 24 P-700 granite missiles, which NATO had given the name SSN-19 Shipwreck. Shipwreck, indeed. These things were 33 feet long, weighing 15,400 pounds, capable of Mach 1.6 speeds, with a range of 388 miles. They could carry conventional high-explosive warheads, but also a 500 kiloton warhead, enough to turn any American ship to dust. These subs were a grand achievement for the Soviets and a major threat to the U.S. Navy. The Kursk was first launched post-Cold War in 1994, but due to a lack of funds for fuel, it rarely saw any action, despite it being one of Russia's most outstanding military machines. The Kursk was so big, as long as two jumbo jets, that there were staterooms for each senior officer. The crew, who back then were paid peanuts if they were paid at all, could enjoy a gymnasium. Although unlike the giant typhoon class, there was no sauna or solarium for those long deployments beneath the sea. Still, the Kursk was a massive piece of machinery, complete with ten separate compartments that could be separated in case something awful should happen. Like the Titanic, the Kursk was called unsinkable, but also, like the Titanic, it definitely was sinkable. In 1999, it was deployed in the Mediterranean Sea with the task of monitoring the United States Sixth Fleet that was responding to the crisis in Kosovo at the time. But for the most part, the Kursk remained unemployed, which meant time gathering dust and crews unable to gain experience on it. In 2000, the Kursk was once again asked to perform. That was after a decade out of action, not counting that short Kosovo deployment. It was time to take part in a large-scale naval exercise, which the Russians named the Summer X Exercise, the biggest naval exercise for many years, costing millions of dollars. It would include 30 Russian ships, including the aircraft carrier Admiral Kuznetsov and the battlecruiser Pyotr Velikitya. Unknown to the Russians, monitoring the exercise were two American submarines, the SS Toledo and the SS Memphis, along with U.S. surface ships and U.S. and Norwegian aircraft monitoring from the skies. The crew on the Kursk was said to be the best in Russia's northern fleet, manning a submarine that was fully armed with granite missiles and torpedoes and was to make a simulated attack on the Kuznetsov. There were no nuclear weapons on board, however. The Kursk's personnel consisted of Captain First Rank Genady P. Lichen, along with 111 crew members, five officers of the 7th SSGN Division Headquarters, and two designers. The first day, the 10th, went fine. The Kursk launched a granite missile armed with a dummy warhead. The mission was a success. On the 12th, the plan was to launch more dummy torpedoes, but this time at the Velekia. At about 8.51 a.m., from the flagship Peter the Great, Fleet Admiral Vlicheslav Popov, commander of the Northern Fleet, radioed the Kursk to fire the torpedo. The last word Popov said was good. The launch was good to go. That was the last time the Kursk radioed anyone, although it wouldn't be the last communication from the Kursk. At 11.28 a.m., there was an explosion. The USS Memphis, still monitoring the exercise, picked up the explosion, which was soon followed by a second larger explosion. The explosions rocked the entire exercise area, especially the second one. Our Norwegian seismic monitoring station recorded both. The Piero Velekia, the 28,000-ton battlecruiser, shook at its rudder. That second explosion had measured a 4.2 on the Richter scale, so it was in fact recorded all over Europe. It was about 250 times more powerful than the initial explosion, powerful enough that seismic stations in Canada and Alaska also recorded the shockwave. The Russian submarine, the Karelia, was also monitoring the exercise and felt the shockwaves. It was obvious to the Americans and the Norwegians that something serious had happened, but for the moment the Russians weren't overly concerned. The shockwaves were reported to top military brass, but at first these reports were ignored. There was radio silence, but Popov, who was accustomed to breakdowns of communications equipment, wasn't worried just yet. As time passed and radio silence remained, his concern grew. The Northern Fleet Headquarters sent another radio message to Kursk, report your coordinates and operations. No answer. The Russians then dispatched a helicopter to see if the submarine had arisen to the surface, but reported back negative. At 6.30 p.m., the Russians set up a search and rescue post. 
Soon after, two IL-38 searching aircraft were also dispatched, returning sometime later to the airfield, having not seen anything. The Russians still had no idea what had happened, but they were now more than a bit concerned. Captain Alexander Teslenko, who was in charge of Russia's search and rescue mission, ordered the Mikhail Rudnitsky to be dispatched to look for the Kursk. This was a 20-year-old lumber carrier that had been converted for submersible rescue operations. The Rudnitsky was equipped with two AS-32 and AS-34 PRIS-class deep submergence rescue vehicles. The ship was also carrying a diving bell, lifting cranes, and gear for underwater rescues. But importantly, it wasn't equipped with specialized stabilizers that could keep it in position in stormy weather. As luck would have it, the weather was about to make a turn for the worst, and the Rudnitsky was not up for the job. We can call this mistake number one, although in all honesty mistakes had been made long before the Kursk was put out to sea. The Russians actually had two India-class rescue submarines, and each of those had small rescue submarines capable of reaching a depth of 2,275 feet. But back in 1995, these were put out of action. They were waiting for repairs in St. Petersburg at the time of the disaster. This was post-Cold War, when Russia's finances were extremely tight. It wasn't until 10.30 p.m that the Northern Fleet declared an emergency. It was only then that the naval exercise was properly shut down. Around 20 ships belonging to the Northern Fleet, including about 3,000 sailors, were tasked with search efforts. All of this was fastidiously recorded. One log tells us, 7 p.m., 0.8 kilograms of delicacy canned food, cod liver in its own juice, was issued to the officer's war room. Rescuers started watching artistic videos. It was only the next morning at about 7 a.m. that Popov had told the Kremlin that they had a possible catastrophe on their hands. The vessel had been found on the seabed, but it wasn't certain if the men were alive in it. The Minister of Defense Igor Sergeyev told Vladimir Putin that Sunday morning, but informed the new boss that he shouldn't go to the disaster site. This is where things got strange. The Russian Navy commander Admiral Vladimir Kuraiodev said at one point that there had been signs of a big and serious collision. Kuraiodev later admitted the chances for a positive outcome are not very high. But collided with what exactly? The US Department of Defense, which as you know had been monitoring the exercise, stated that there was no indication that a US vessel was involved in the accident. The US believed there had been an explosion, but it couldn't be ascertained what had caused it. Even though the Russians knew this was now potentially a large-scale catastrophe, Popov spoke to the public that Sunday and called the mission a resounding success. He almost certainly knew at the time that something resoundingly cataclysmic had happened. In reports that followed, the public heard that there had been some minor technical difficulties, but everyone on board is alive. No one knew that, however. Like Chernobyl many years earlier, the Russian bigwigs were keeping this under wraps for as long as possible. It was only on Monday that the Russians publicly admitted that the Kursk was in serious trouble, but even then, the families of the men on the ship were not told anything that resembled the truth. They were also told that the accident happened on Sunday when it happened on Saturday. Attempts to reach the sub were aborted many times. At this point, the Americans, as well as France, Germany, Israel, Italy, Norway, and Britain all believed something grave had happened. When they contacted the Russians, they were told the rescue was going fine. Russia refused any assistance. The Russian public certainly didn't want to hear about this, as 118 fine young men were potentially sitting on the seabed 354 feet down. The weather got even worse, so the search was hampered by poor visibility. There was still some hope, although by now the wives and relatives of the men were hearing horrible rumors. They weren't getting the truth from the government or the navy, but word was getting around that their loved ones on that sub were never coming back. The news was getting out to Russian journalists who were using every trick in the book to get their story, bribing officials and even pretending to be part of a rescue team. The families kept being told that all attempts to save the men were being made, but what they weren't being informed about is that many attempts to get the sub were being botched. The equipment wasn't good enough for the job. The bad weather was also playing a big part in making things much harder. At times, the diving bell was thrown around by powerful undersea currents. Things went from bad to worse. One time, one of the rescue vehicles was broken when it was being loaded back into the ship. It was a nightmare scenario for all involved. On further attempts, even when they could get to the sub, they couldn't attach the diving bell. Time was running out. It was estimated that the men on the submarine could possibly have enough air until the 18th. That's what the families heard, but later they were told differently, that the men could survive longer. It was on the 18th that the British and Norwegians were finally allowed to join the search. The family still had no idea what was going on. 
Sometimes reports stated that the crew was sending SOS messages by tapping on the sub. Hearing the little taps of SOS messages were coming from the Kursk was about the best news relatives had in days. But were those knocking sounds men or something hitting the sub from the outside? On the 19th, the Norwegian ship named the Normand Pioneer arrived on the scene carrying the British rescue submarine LR-5. Both the Norwegians and the British complained that the Russians were making their job harder. Vice Admiral E. Skorgen of the Norwegian Navy told a newspaper, from time to time the information given to the Norwegian side was so inauthentic that it threatened the safety of the divers. At one point, the Russians discharged the Brits from the operation altogether, which Paddy Heron of the British team said was repugnant. The Russians were still embracing the secrecy of the Cold War in the year 2000, yet the relatives of the crew heard nothing of this. The Russians said the Brits and Norwegians were making the job impossible. The mood changed on Monday, August 21st at 7.45 a.m. when a Norwegian rescuer opened the upper door of an emergency hatch. He saw no people in the airlock. At 1 p.m., the hatch of the airlock was opened. The sub was completely flooded, and when the divers opened one of the compartments, they found dead bodies scattered everywhere. There were no signs of life anywhere they looked as they checked other compartments. Admiral Popov and Vice Admiral Skorgen had to accept the truth. Everyone was dead. At 9 p.m. that night, the Military Council of the Northern Fleet officially reported the loss of all the crew. The families were informed, wives and children wept, but many were angered on how this whole operation had gone down. What they'd been told didn't make sense. Popov appeared on Russian TV and took off his cap, telling the cameras, forgive me for not saving your sailors. It still wasn't exactly certain who had died on the sub. Not all the names had been announced, although sneaky journalists bribed officials again and soon the names appeared on TV. The Russian Federation asked Norway for further help with the removal of the sailors' bodies. The bodies of the dead were to be removed through eight special holes that were made in the hull. Norway's Stolt offshore company signed a contract for between five to seven million dollars, because this was not going to be an easy operation. While they were in mourning, the relatives of the deceased heard more lies. Most of them were soon taken by the passenger ship Klavdia Yelenskaya to the scene of the incident and informed that absolutely all of the information and the condition of the site was made available to foreign specialists. That wasn't true in the least. The question was, had those foreigners been tasked with the job earlier, would they have found living humans on that sub? Had Russia's stalling cost lives? If it had, the Russian public would have crucified the military as well as the government. Military bigwigs were accused of incompetence. Instead of offering apologies, one of the generals called the journalists traitorous and the Navy personnel who'd spoken to them scum. This was a bad time for Russia and for Putin. In a poll, 60% of Russians said the disaster hadn't changed their support for him, but 27.8% said the disaster had diminished their support for him. Losing almost a third of your voter base in a matter of days isn't exactly great for a political leader. Putin soon discovered that his own military had misled him something he would take out on them in the weeks to come. For now, he had to save his own face, and he did that by offering what the US reported was an unprecedented compensation package to the close relatives of the deceased. This amounted to an apartment and 720,000 rubles, or $26,000. All of the dead were honored with the Order of Valor, while victims got other goodies such as free telephone services and electricity. This was exceedingly generous, given the men were on about $600 a month, and as we mentioned before, many of them hadn't been paid in a while. Even with his public relations save, Putin struggled to wipe the pie from his face. Russia looked bad in the eyes of the world. He looked bad. The military looked totally incompetent. No amount of free phone calls was going to clean up this mess. Some of the widows were suspicious of the kindness. One widow told the press, we get a lot more than Chechen widows, ten times more. The Russian government doesn't give money out like that for nothing. There must be something they're trying to hide. They must feel guilty. Indeed. That question again emerged. Could those men have survived if the Russian Navy hadn't been so incompetent, or their equipment had been better, or more importantly, had Russia allowed the UK and Norway to help earlier in the rescue? Just how fast had those guys died, and what had killed them exactly? Just before we tell you this, you should know that what people were saying had happened prior to an official investigation. Of course, there were some wild theories in Russia and also in the West. The main hypothesis was a collision, and less so, the sub hitting a World War II-era mine. Russian officials clung to the collision theory. Some other officials wondered if NATO had struck the sub. And the odd armchair expert believed that a mass poisoning on board or a new secret Russian weapon hitting the submarine 
led to the disaster. Some even speculated that it was a UFO attack. It seemed Russia was going with the collision story at first. On August 24th, the Russian main office of military prosecutor started proceedings against whoever had caused the accident. This was according to a Clause 263.3 of the Russian Criminal Code, which related to violation of safety traffic regulations on railway, air or water lines, entailed on carelessness, death of two or more persons. Guilty parties could be sent to prison for four to ten years. The officials involved in these proceedings were all under the hammer, so it suited them that a collision rather than equipment faults and their incompetence had killed those men. The worst thing about this investigation was that they led it, their own hand-picked team. Outside investigators were persona non grata. It was high stakes for President Putin, too, faced with what the Washington Post called the first major political crisis of his presidency. These were the days when the US media actually liked Putin, a man some said that the US could do business with. For Putin, only four months into his presidency, this was life or death. He'd been roundly criticized for choosing to stay at a seaside resort at the start of the chaos, a public relations nightmare for a president when your country's in the middle of a disaster. When Putin did finally meet with about 350 relatives of the crew, journalists were not invited. Although some pretended to be relatives, many of the real relatives screamed at him, their eyes filled with tears and their mouths firing off every curse word under the Russian sun. It looked as though they were going to beat the hell out of him. They screamed, who killed our boys? Who will be punished? Putin was under some serious pressure. One woman, Nadezhda Tylik, who was the mother of Kursk submariner Lieutenant Sergei Tylik, was absolutely enraged. She screamed at Putin and the other officials, you better shoot yourselves now, we won't let you live. A nurse then sneaked up behind her and injected her with a sedative. This also became a controversy for Putin. At first, Nadezhda's husband claimed he'd asked the nurse to do that because she, his wife, was prone to excessive emotions. A few months later, Nadezhda told the truth. She said her husband had lied. He hadn't asked anyone for help. The nurse was part of the official gang. Nadezhda told the press, the injection was done to shut my mouth. Immediately after it, I just lost the ability to speak and was carried out. She later told the St. Petersburg Times that Putin did not know how to respond to their questions. She added, they told us lies the whole time, and even now, we're unable to get any information. The Western media picked up on the incident, saying it harkened back to the Cold War days. The Russian response was that it was nothing out of the ordinary. Regarding the Cold War-style injection, the Times newspaper in Britain was told by Russian officials, we are simply protecting the relatives from undue pain. It was for her own protection. A Russian journalist later explained the likely reason why they knocked out Nadezhda. He said, I honestly thought that they would tear him, Putin, apart. There was such a heavy atmosphere there, such a lot of hatred, despair, and pain. I never felt anything like it anywhere in my entire life. Much of the Russian media knew something was amiss, and many newspapers weren't afraid to say it. The Russian newspaper Izvestia wrote, Lies and fears are the features of the Russian authority. When people's lives are involved, admirals, generals, and government officials should not lie, dodge, and think about their own career. This is blasphemy. The officials even took flack from retired Russian military bigwigs, one of whom, Yevgeny Azhnabaev, said, It's become a form of theater. This is a performance for the whole world. Even though a Norwegian company had been contracted to get the dead out of there, the Russians told him that after they drilled the hole in the sub, only Russian divers were allowed inside. This suited the Russian officials, of course. When those Russian divers finally got inside the sub, they did so through compartment 9, although it was difficult to see as there was so much ash in the water. The Russians gradually worked their way through several compartments, greeted on their way by badly burned bodies. This didn't look like a collision. Russian officials were still selling the story that there'd been some sort of collision. They said the vessel had plummeted to the seabed, and everyone had pretty much died immediately. Some officials entertained the narrative that the collision had been with a NATO spying submarine. A few of them stuck with this tale for years after the accident, given that anti-Western propaganda was how they stayed in their job. But once the Russian divers found 12 bodies in compartment 9, they knew this had been no collision and the instant death of everyone. Those brave men in the compartment had not died straight away. They'd made their way to that compartment, but how long they were alive after the initial event was the question. Some said three days, which would mean they could have been rescued had the foreign teams been able to help earlier. The investigations went on for years, filling 133 volumes. The relatives were then told something that started to sound more like the truth, something that refuted the story that the men had survived more than a few hours in compartment 9. 
They were informed that the crew had tried to load a dummy torpedo for the training exercise, but a problem with the weld on the torpedo had led to a leak of high test peroxide, which created an explosion. The torpedo manufacturer said outright that there was no way this could have happened. Still, that's the story that the Russian investigators stuck with, and it's the one that does make the most sense to anyone familiar with the story. They said the explosion started a fire and destroyed the bulkhead between the first and second compartments. They said this killed everyone in the control room or at least severely injured them. The much bigger second explosion was caused by five to seven torpedo warheads going off as a result of the first explosion. The sailors people heard had blown themselves up. This second explosion completely wrecked the compartments and tore a massive hole in the hull. The nuclear reactors, it was said, shut down without any problems. Just about everyone was already dead after explosion two, but 23 men managed to get to compartment nine, where they did indeed survive, but only for about six more hours, not a matter of days. It was said the oxygen they were breathing was depleted, so they tried to change to a potassium superoxide chemical oxygen cartridge but it somehow fell into the oily water and that blew up. Some more men were killed instantly, while others either died in the resulting fire or suffocated due to the fire consuming all of their oxygen. The only surviving notes from the sub were found in compartment 9. Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Kolesnikov wrote in one note, It's 1315. All personnel from section 6, 7, and 8 have moved to section 9. 23 people are here. We feel bad, weakened by carbon dioxide. Pressure is increasing in the compartment. If we head for the surface, we won't survive the compression. None of us can escape. Two hours later, he wrote, It's dark here to write, but I'll try by feel. It seems like there are no chances, 10 to 20 percent. Let's hope that at least someone will read this. Here's the list of personnel from the other sections who are now in the ninth and will attempt to get out. Regards to everyone, no need to despair. Kolesnikov. Russia's Izvestia newspaper reported that a note written inside a novel that was wrapped in plastic was found in the pocket of the deceased Lieutenant Commander Rashid Aryapov. The Russian rescue crew said the newspaper had taken the note when it was hoovering up secret documents. Part of it read, faults in the torpedo compartment, namely the explosion of a torpedo on which the Kursk had to carry out tests. This didn't, of course, gel with the collision theory the Russian government peddled for so long initially, which explains why the note went missing. So that was the story, but as you can imagine, it didn't exactly make the families of the dead men feel any better. They all asked what the BBC asked at the time. Why was the state-of-the-art nuclear submarine designed to withstand the full wrath of an enemy fleet so easily destroyed by a practice torpedo, which didn't even have a warhead? And why had the torpedo, which was apparently leaking explosive fuel, not been checked properly? The northern Russian fleet admitted that some mistakes had been made. It was time for the government shuffle. Putin transferred Popyov and the fleet commander chief of staff Mikhail Motsak. Igor Sergeyev resigned as minister of defense, and he was, for the first time in modern Russian history, replaced with someone not from the military, which apparently appalled other members of the military. Had the young Putin lost faith in his generals? During these shuffles, Putin made a point of saying that the collision theory was not true. Another proponent of that theory was Deputy Prime Minister Ilya Klebanov, who'd been sure a foreign sub had hit the Kursk. Putin demoted him to the Minister of Industry, Science, and Technology. Twelve high-ranking military officers got the boot, but in typical authoritarian style, Putin said it had nothing to do with the disaster. The relatives were still furious. They'd heard there'd been stunning breaches of discipline, shoddy, obsolete, and poorly maintained equipment, as well as negligence, incompetence, and mismanagement. Relatives became even more angered when they heard about the escape capsules on the Kursk, which evidently couldn't have been used. Then Vice Admiral Valery Rizantsev said the unsayable when he told the world those men on the sub were barely trained, while the sub had been poorly maintained and inspections had been infrequent which was likely why the crew made the mistake that led to the initial explosion. The crew had been taught all the maintenance routines that had to happen before firing off a torpedo, but the Kursk hadn't fired one before that fateful day for three whole years. Books were written about the incident and documentaries were made. Even after the official theory had been presented, alternative theories spread through the internet like wildfire. People blamed the two Dagestani weapon specialists on board, saying they were actually Chechen terrorists. Russia was at war with Chechnya at the time of the incident and remained at war until 2009. There were other theories that the Russian government certainly didn't want to be proven true. 
According to the book Democratic Breakdown and the Decline of the Russian Military, some journalists in the West as well as inside Russia claimed that they had evidence that the Kursk had been blown up after the battlecruiser Peter Velikitya accidentally launched a torpedo at it. The Russian Navy called this an invention, and to this day it seems that's true. Even so, we'll never know for sure what caused the explosions. We know they happened, but we can't be sure why they happened. It could have been mutiny, it could have been an accidental attack. Once the government started lying, the theory started expanding. As that book we just mentioned stated, the dearth of credible information undoubtedly contributed to the many absurd conspiracy theories. In a poll in 2000, 79% of Russians interviewed ticked a box saying the government was hiding the reasons for the tragedy. Only 11% said they were confident the government was telling the truth. It's often said the late, great George Orwell once wrote, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. It's a good quote to end our video with, but accrediting it to Orwell is itself probably part of a conspiracy theory. There's a new monster in the waters of the Pacific, and it's taken the US Navy by surprise. Not projected to enter service for some time yet, the US Navy was surprised by the speed with which China is finishing construction on its latest nuclear-powered submarine, the Type 096. Known as a lackluster submarine power, the Type 96 will strengthen the submarine portion of the Chinese nuclear triad and be the first true modern offering, and it's got the US military planners seriously concerned. Historically, China has not been a great submarine power, with the tech behind these stealthy machines being jealously guarded by every major power. This is the one piece of technology the Chinese weren't able to either steal from the US or the Soviets, or reverse engineer from purchased Soviet hulls. Lacking the maturity and expertise of Western shipbuilders, China's efforts to create a capable submarine fleet have been subpar. In the 1980s, China began development on the Type 93 nuclear-powered attack submarine as a replacement to their first-generation Type 91. The second generation of nuclear sub is now the most modern of China's submarine fleet, albeit with significant upgrades. Known as the Type 93A Shang-2 class, it's complemented by the Jin class Type 94A, which serves as China's nuclear deterrent, armed with 12 nuclear ballistic missiles. But these subs are built on old Soviet nuclear sub technology traded by the Russians in the early 1990s when they ran into significant cash troubles. Technical support and key design elements were provided by the Rubin Design Bureau for Marine Engineering, the Central Naval Agency of Russia. From this starting point, China built the Shang class, which featured modern improvements over the old Russian designs. In recent years, though, China's been building on lessons learned and incorporating new technologies to build a more competent and deadly submarine fleet. China is already deploying its newest conventional submarine, the Type 39C Yuan class, to Taiwan's territorial waters. This is an air-independent propulsion design, which utilizes diesel engines to charge banks of electronic batteries and then cruises under battery power. Diesel submarines are both incredibly lethal and incredibly vulnerable. They operate by electric power drawn from massive banks of batteries, typically giving them an endurance of days. Because there is no engine or nuclear reactor with moving parts operating while submerged, diesel subs are notoriously difficult to locate while running on electric power. However, when that charge runs low, diesel subs are forced to surface and extend snorkels so they can run a diesel engine and recharge their batteries without asphyxiating their crews. This is when a diesel sub turns from predator to helpless prey, as the extended snorkels become a dead giveaway to a surface radar. New snorkels feature radar-absorbing materials, but high-resolution radars can still spot them at long ranges, and sensors known as diesel sniffers can lead a warship directly to the location of a charging diesel submarine. Not to mention that while near the surface, any airborne anti-submarine assets will easily spot the big submarine. Air-independent propulsion technology aims to dramatically increase the endurance of vulnerable diesel submarines by allowing them to make full use of their extreme stealth. AIP comes in four varieties. The first is closed-cycle diesel engines. These types of boats store a supply of oxygen, typically in liquid form, aboard the submarine. This oxygen is then pumped to the engines, which it uses for combustion. However, in order for the engines to run safely, the oxygen is mixed with an inert gas like argon that simulates real atmospheric oxygen. The exhaust gas is then chilled and scrubbed to extract leftover oxygen and argon before the rest of the waste gas is simply discharged into the seawater. Despite it being the cheapest of AIP options and in service since 1960, the technology is not in wide use today due to the need of stored liquid oxygen on board. The highly reactive gas is extremely prone to starting fires, as the Soviets found out during the Cold War. 
Closed-cycle steam turbines are a second AIP alternative that improves on the core concept of closed-cycle technology. Operated only by the French, this method combusts ethanol and oxygen under high pressure to generate steam, which is in turn used to run a turbine a similar system to what we see in nuclear-powered submarines. The combustion occurs at such a high pressure that carbon dioxide can then be expelled directly into the sea at any depth without using a compressor. This AIP alternative has one huge advantage, a very high power output which means a very fast submarine outrunning even nuclear-powered boats. However, it's a very inefficient process which means oxygen consumption is extremely high. The system that powers this technology is also said to be extremely complex, which is not something you want to hear if your sub breaks down hundreds of miles from shore. Due to the high cost, low efficiency, and extreme complexity, global navies opt for the next two technologies instead. Stirling cycle engines are a closed cycle engine concept that has a working fluid, a substance such as the steam in nuclear-powered submarines which drives the shaft, permanently contained within the system itself. The working fluid is heated which in turn moves the pistons and runs the submarine engine. A generator coupled to the engine provides electricity and recharges the onboard batteries. Typically liquid oxygen is used as an oxidizer and regular old diesel fuel is used to run the engine, with the exhaust scrubbed and released into the seawater. Compared with other AIP technologies, Stirling cycle engines are much cheaper and less complex, and run on regular old diesel making them cheap to refuel. They're also much quieter than closed cycle steam turbine engines, but a lot noisier than fuel cell diesel submarines. The submarine is also limited to a dive depth of 200 meters while the engine is engaged. Fuel cell AIP tech is the most popular and widely used today. Fuel cells convert chemical energy into electricity, typically by using a fuel and an oxidizer. Hydrogen, the fuel, is typically allowed to react with oxygen, with the chemical energy producing electricity, while water and heat are released as byproducts. Currently, Germany is the world leader in fuel cell technology and supplies most of the world's demand for AIP diesel submarines. However, France is working on a next-generation fuel cell diesel submarine, and India is looking to integrate the technology into its own subs. Fuel cells have almost no moving parts and thus allow for an incredible level of stealth. They can also achieve a fuel efficiency as high as 80%, giving their submarine great endurance. Hydrogen fuel cells also have the added bonus of creating no byproducts except for water and heat, making them environmentally friendly. The only major drawback to the technology is that they are very technologically complex and very expensive, limiting who can afford them. While details remain scarce, it's believed that China's Yuan class is using a Stirling engine, which has interesting implications as to how China plans to use this new attack submarine. America famously operates an all-nuclear submarine fleet, and that's because America seeks to hold every potential enemy at arm's length. This is key to the U.S. success throughout the 20th and 21st century. The ultimate goal is and always has been to ensure the homeland remains completely untouched in time of war. Diesel submarines have greatly limited range due to their need to carry fuel stores, while nuclear submarines are limited only by how much food you can pack on for the crew. Air-independent propulsion technology can greatly increase a diesel sub's range while removing its vulnerability as the sub no longer needs to snorkel, but it's still ultimately limited in range by the amount of fuel it can carry, and refueling your submarine halfway across the Pacific is going to be a dead giveaway to the enemy. Thus, the option to field a new diesel AIP submarine means that China's looking to address regional, not global concerns, namely Japanese, Australian, Taiwanese, and American forces in its own backyard in a potential struggle over Taiwan. Operating only a few hundred miles from friendly ports, AIP is an excellent choice for the Chinese Navy, coming in at a fraction of the price of a US nuclear submarine while enjoying the benefits of extreme stealth. Nuclear submarines may have unlimited endurance, but they're also notoriously noisy as the nuclear reactor is constantly operating and can never be shut down. This problem has forced the US to spend billions on silencing technology, and today tracking a US nuclear submarine has been described as it being easier to simply listen for silent spots in the ocean. Outside of crashed UFO technology and the true origin of Bigfoot, silencing technology for its nuclear fleet is one of the US's most closely guarded secrets. Cost matters in a war between the US and China, because China knows that it has a considerable disadvantage in the undersea realm. A decade ago, Chinese submarines were described by sonar operators as sounding like the contents of a kitchen drawer bouncing around the bed of a truck going 40 miles per hour down a dirt road. 
Today, it's made leaps and bounds in silencing its notoriously noisy boats, prompting some U.S. admirals to comment on the improved capabilities observed by American patrols in the Pacific. But the U.S. is the old dog in the undersea game, even if it let its ASW capabilities seriously atrophy after the Cold War, leading to some embarrassing kills during exercises against friendly diesel subs in the early 2000s. Thus, China expects to lose a significant number of subs in a fight against the U.S. and its allies. And having a submarine that costs less than half of a U.S. nuclear-powered attack submarine becomes an incredibly attractive option, even if you're being forced to sacrifice the capability to project power globally. It's incredibly difficult to determine just how much of a threat the Yuan class is, though, given the extreme secrecy that shrouds any nation's attack submarines. What we do know we can infer from current developments, projected needs, and observations of the submarine itself. The sail, for example, has been redesigned from previous models, implying a greater need for surface or near-surface stealth. This could be because of very long transit times in and out of Chinese ports, or because the submarine will have a strong focus on the insertion of Special Forces troops. We also know that the aft casing has been extended to contain a towed sonar array, a typical feature of modern submarines that allows them to operate a sonar safely from a distance. Since enemy submarines are looking for the noise of your own sonar, towing it several hundred meters behind you is a safe way of using it actively while not getting yourself blown up. This capability has long been missing from Chinese submarines and makes the Yuan class a significantly more dangerous ASW opponent. The whole of the Yuan class also appears to be using a new type of anechoic coating, and it's missing the rubber tiles visible on earlier models on top of the hull. Rubber tiles are still used along the bottom of the boat though, and the new coating visible on the top does appear to be rubberized but slightly uneven. This could signify ongoing manufacturing troubles for China, which has lagged significantly behind the West in extreme precision manufacturing or advanced tooling machines such as the 5 or 7-axis tool machines. Similar lack of high precision can be seen on the J-20 Stealth Fighter, which has noticeable gaps in panels which increase its radar signature. The Yuan class is likely primarily an anti-ship platform, which makes sense for a conflict in the South Pacific. This differs from the US, which primarily uses its attack subs to hunt for other submarines, only then turning their weapons on surface targets. Weapon stowage is believed to number at around 18 and could include the latest YJ-18B supersonic anti-ship cruise missile, which would make the sub a significant threat to the US Navy surface vessels. However, whether it carries the YJ-18Bs or the older YJ-82 conventional anti-ship missiles, the Yuan will still need to link up with off-board assets to effectively target surface ships, rendering it vulnerable to kill chain disruption. On top of anti-ship missiles, the Yuan will carry standard dual-purpose anti-ship and anti-submarine torpedoes, but seems to also be equipped to conduct mining operations. This falls in line with the People's Liberation Army Navy's plan to create an anti-access area denial strategy that slows down U.S. response in any war in the South Pacific. The Yuan class represents an evolving threat from China's underwater forces and a significant leap forward in submarine technology. By 2025, the DoD predicts that China's massive shipbuilding industry will have fielded 42 operational Yuans, which is bad news considering that this is exactly when many predict the US and China will be going to war. For the time being, it's widely believed that America's Virginia class remains the world's best attack submarine, but losses will be inevitable and the fate of the Pacific might be decided by who can afford to replenish their naval assets the fastest. Here, China has both the cost and production advantage, which should send alarm bells ringing at the Pentagon. How would you like to spend months living in a cramped metal tube hundreds of meters below the surface of the sea, surrounded by nothing but darkness? Would you still volunteer for this job knowing that all that separated you from instant death was a few inches of steel? Or that if that steel were to fail, you would actually be incinerated by the water compressing all the air and igniting the oxygen like a piston before being crushed and turned into a jelly? Or even worse, you could survive in a watertight compartment only to drop to the bottom of the ocean with a dull thump as you sit in cold, wet darkness for days, waiting for the oxygen to run out. Because when things go wrong on a submarine, even the best case scenario is almost always a death sentence. This show is not for the faint of heart. These are the worst submarine disasters in history. Russian Submarine Nerpa, 2008. Imagine hearing the sudden clanging of waterproof doors shutting behind you and in front of you, followed by the sudden roar of a strange gas entering the chamber you've been locked into. It displaces all the oxygen, eventually driving it from your lungs as well. You're asphyxiating in full atmosphere, desperately clawing at the window where the rest of the crew watches you slowly choke to death unable to help you. Now imagine that all this is happening because some idiot was messing around with equipment he wasn't even meant to have access to. 
This was the fate of 20 people aboard the Russian submarine Nerpa, an Akula-class submarine. The Nerpa was undergoing sea trials before formally joining the Russian Navy. On the 8th of November, she was deep beneath the waves of the Russian Pacific Fleet's test range in Peter the Great Gulf, an inlet of the Sea of Japan. On board the submarine were 208 people, an oversized complement made up of 81 actual military personnel and 127 engineers from the shipyards which had built and fitted the sub. This is not an uncommon practice in world navies, as it allows for engineers to be on board as systems undergo troubleshooting, and it's a hell of a motivator to make sure you do your job right, because there's little chance to rescue you if you messed up designing or building the submarine. At around 8 p.m., the NERPA underwent its first dive, and a half hour later, disaster struck. All was going well when suddenly two forward compartments were sealed by automatically locking doors. The watertight doors are meant to seal in case of emergency and cannot be easily overridden. Approximately 60 people were cut off from the rest of the submarine. Inside the sealed compartments, confusion reigned, until suddenly the crew noticed that the automatic firefighting system had engaged. Now, dibromo-tetrafluoroethane began to flood the compartment, displacing all of the oxygen. This gas is specifically engineered to suppress fires and then interfere with the chemical process of combustion itself. However, in high concentrations, it can cause narcosis, leading straight to death via asphyxiation, plus inflicting injury via frostbite due to its extreme chilling effect. The trapped crew began to beat fervently on the door, but it would be 30 minutes before the fire suppression system was disabled and the room ventilated, and only then were the men actually rescued. The destroyer, Admiral Tributz, and the submarine rescue vessel, Sayani, were dispatched immediately to provide assistance, but the submarine was able to return under its own power back to port. 41 people were injured by the asphyxiation or the frostbite effect of the gas on their lungs. Another 20 would die. Two official causes were investigated by the Russians. The Nerpus fire suppression system was state-of-the-art for the time. While older model systems relied on manual activation, the Nerpus new system could be set to automatic mode. This allowed the submarine to monitor itself for any fires and immediately move to extinguish them. With fire being the worst nightmare for any submariner, the value of such a high-tech automatic system could not be understated. In order to avoid suffocating, the crew were extensively drilled on how to properly respond to the activation of the firefighting system, which was preceded by klaxons and warning lights. Men in the affected compartments were to immediately don oxygen masks in order to survive the half hour it would take to ventilate the compartment. This is one big reason why so many were seriously injured or died. Most of those in the affected compartments were civilian engineers who had not received such training. While the Nerpus firefighting system was state-of-the-art, it was also Russian, which left it prone to multiple malfunctions during its installation on the sub. According to the testimony from one of the engineers who helped build the sub, the firefighting system had malfunctioned before and the 2008 tragedy could have been another such malfunction. However, a second, even dumber explanation does exist. Five days after the accident, naval investigators announced that crewman Dmitry Grobov had been responsible, turning on the system, quote, without permission or any particular grounds. In plain speak, this means that Grobov was messing around, as board sailors are known to do, though typically in professional navies they don't murder or injure dozens of people as a result. According to military reports, Grobov started playing with the fire suppression system out of boredom believing that it had been disconnected. Local control units are protected by five-digit access codes, but during sea trials, the access codes were stenciled directly onto the units. Grobov accessed the panel, increased the readings coming from the affected compartments from 30 degrees calcium, or whatever Europeans measure with, to 78 degrees chocobo. The system asked for permission to do its job, and Grobov granted it, no doubt thinking this was the most cutting-edge video technology in all of Russia. Colleagues were skeptical of the military report, though, describing Grobov as a skilled and experienced specialist. To be honest, since the Russian military's performance in the Ukraine war, we've learned that this in no way excluded the possibility of Grobov stupidly murdering two dozen people out of inept boredom. Others doubted that Grobov could have done this alone because the system required multiple levels of confirmation before being activated, and all that means is that multiple Russian sailors were equally inept. We're really trying hard not to be biased here, but this is the same navy that's currently losing a war against a nation with no navy. Because this is Russia, Mikhail Barabanov, editor-in-chief of Moscow Defense Brief, said that accidental discharges of fire suppression systems aboard Russian submarines weren't unheard of, though they don't usually result in fatalities since the crew is trained on how to react. For new Russian submariners, 
It must be a real morale boost to know that they receive constant training to know how to react in case of a disastrous fire or if the submarine randomly decides to try to kill you because, oh, by the way, it will absolutely try to do that. ARA San Juan, Argentina, 2017 The San Juan was a diesel-electric submarine in service with the Argentinian Navy since 1985. Just a few years prior to its disappearance, though, it had undergone midlife maintenance, upgrading its engine and batteries. A small diesel-electric attack sub, it was a stealthy boat that in 1994 managed to evade U.S. anti-submarine forces during an exercise and sunk the U.S. command ship USS Mount Whitney. On November 17, 2017, though, tragedy struck, and the reason why still remains a mystery. The day before it went missing, the sub had sent a report that the snorkel had leaked water into the forward storage batteries, causing a small fire. The fire, however, was extinguished successfully and the batteries disconnected to prevent further problems. The submarine then continued on its mission using power from its aft batteries. For two days, the submarine failed to report in, at which point a search was immediately launched. The last known location was recorded on the 15th of November when the boat was 430 kilometers or 270 moon landing miles off the coast of Argentina in the San Jorge Gulf and on its way to Mar del Plata. The boat had just concluded an exercise with the Argentinian Navy and was heading to deeper waters. The search was undertaken with the assistance of the International Submarine Escape and Rescue Liaison Office, which had been established by 40 countries in 2003 as a result of the Kursk disaster. With a search area of 482,507 kilometers, 186,297 proper square miles, and alternating weather conditions, it was like finding a needle in a very turbulent haystack. With no success and only seven days of oxygen on board, hope was dwindling. Argentina requested the use of hydrophones operated by the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization for help in its search. This global network of hydrophones had been installed to prevent nations from cheating on the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty by blowing up nukes underwater. Searching the CTBO's records, an anomaly consistent with the sound of a submarine implosion was confirmed on November 23rd. The event also matched closely with the loss of communication with the sub. The search continued, in hopes of at least finding the wreckage, possibly even survivors in a watertight compartment. Though all knew hope was slim. By November 24th, the search involved 13 countries including the United States, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and even the former Falklands war rival the United Kingdom. Searching an area the size of Spain, though, Argentina was forced to concede on November 30th, 15 days after the San Juan went missing, that rescue efforts were over. There was now only the search for wreckage. A year later, the remains of the crushed submarine was discovered at a depth of 907 meters, just 12 kilometers or 12 miles from the location of the implosion sound. All 44 crewmen were lost, including Argentina's first female submarine officer. KRI Nangala, Indonesia, 2021 Originally purchased in 1977, the nearly 50-year-old submarine had undergone two major refits in its life. The latest in 2012 was undertaken in a South Korean shipyard and modernized many of the sub's Cold War systems. In a possible forewarning of disaster to come, though, three crew members were killed just months after the South Korean refit when a torpedo failed to launch during an exercise. The Nangala was damaged enough that it needed to be sent back for repairs. On April 21, 2021, the Nangala was undergoing torpedo drills. At 3 a.m., the captain asked for permission to dive in order to fire a live torpedo. By 4 a.m., the sub was flooding its torpedo tubes, and at 4.25, the Indonesian Navy received its last communication as the commanding officer of the training task force sent his authorization to go ahead with the firing. The Nangala fired a live torpedo and then a training torpedo and went silent. By 9.37 a.m., the Navy sent a distress call to the International Submarine Escape and Rescue Liaison Office, declaring the submarine missing and likely sunk. It was believed that the submarine could have experienced a power outage, causing it to plummet to a depth of around 600 to 700 meters. This was really bad news, as the sub only had a crush depth of 500 meters. A previous power outage had nearly caused disaster, with the boat being saved by the emergency blowing of the forward ballast tanks. While submarines typically have a greater crush depth than publicly recorded, the Bali Sea is known for its underwater canyons, which can reach depths of over 1,500 meters. If the Nangala had fallen into one of those canyons, its fate was sealed. However, if the submarine had lost power and had come to rest above its crush depth, the crew had approximately three days of oxygen to survive on. But others expressed doubt. The submarine was supposed to carry only 38 people, but had been loaded with 53 when it was lost. 
That would cut their oxygen almost in half. A crisis center with a mobile hyperbaric chamber was established at 2nd Fleet Command HQ in Sarabia, and soon multiple nations had joined in the search effort. The United States sent in multiple Poseidon aircraft which specialized in hunting down submarines. Singapore deployed submarine rescue vessels, and the Royal Malaysian Navy sent the MV Mega Bhakti submarine rescue ship. The Indian Navy made available its deep submergence rescue vehicle, which departed from Visakhapatnam, Andhra Pradesh and would be at the search site within days. Indonesian divers began searching for the sub in shallower waters, while warships, other submarines, and multiple aircraft began to look around the last known location of the Nangala. On April 22nd at 7 a.m., traces of an oil spill, possibly fuel and lubricating oils from the submarine, were discovered near where the boat had been observed diving. Hydrophones in the area confirmed that whatever had happened, there had not been an implosion, keeping hopes alive. A false detection of a magnetic object by an Indonesian cruiser raised hopes, but the sub was not located. On the 24th, the Indonesian Navy announced the discovery of debris, including a part associated with torpedo tubes, a coolant pipe insulator, a bottle of periscope grease, and prayer rugs all within 10 miles of the last point of contact. The Nangala was declared sunk, and later a sonar scan discovered the submarine at a depth of 850 meters, 350 meters past its official crush depth. An ROV with a max depth of 1,000 meters was launched by the Singaporean ship MV Swift Rescue, which made visual contact with the remains of the submarine on the bottom. The submarine had split into three parts, and it was not believed to have imploded given no recorded implosion sounds on nearby hydrophones. A power outage was suspected, as previously a blown electrical fuse forced the emergency blowing of the main ballast tank, so the sub could surface. There were also suspicions of the work done by the South Korean firm which undertook the boat's refit in 2012, given the failed torpedo firing test later that year that killed three. However, others pointed at the submarine being 15 people over its max capacity of 38 personnel. Later, it was revealed that the commander of the Nangala, Lt. Col. Harry Octavian, had voiced frustrations over the poor maintenance that the sub had received to a reporter who published an article with his complaints. Octavian complained of poor quality work as well as frequent delays by state-owned shipyard PTPAL Indonesia. Another officer had been disciplined by his superiors after voicing his own complaints about poor workmanship from the state-owned shipyard, which had assembled the Changbogo-class KRI Alugorok, another submarine of which Lt. Col. Octavian commented, This submarine by PTPAL, there's nothing good about it. The Nangala was also apparently nearly 12 years behind schedule on major maintenance, despite subs needing to go in for major refits every six years. Number 361, China, 2003. It's one of the most tragic submarine disasters in history, and it left the submarine itself completely untouched. Despite the staggering loss of life, if you had to die in a submarine accident, this is probably about as gentle as it's going to happen. Number 361 was an aging boat by the time of her accident and this likely led to her disaster. A Ming-3 class submarine, she was a clone of the old Soviet Romeo class, built between the 1950s and early 60s. A diesel electric boat, she was meant for coastal defense missions and incapable of true blue water operations. In the early 2000s, China was beginning to assert itself against the US in the South Pacific, laying down the foundations of what it would ultimately call anti-access area denial. China undertook a massive ramp up in training and exercises with its submarine forces, its subs may have been vastly outclassed by modern U.S. boats, but even an old submarine can present a significant threat in the right circumstance. On April 16, 2003, the number 361 was partaking in naval exercises east of the inner Changshan Islands in the Yellow Sea, just off the coast of northeastern China. The crew included a full complement along with 13 trainee cadets from the Chinese Naval Academy. The exercise was simulating real wartime conditions and thus the submarine was out of contact for days or even weeks at a time. The Chinese military, however, did not have a strong history of realistic training, something it continues to struggle with. And this, coupled with the age of the boat and possible toll of corruption within the Chinese military, could have all contributed to what happened next. At some point in time while submerged, the submarine's diesel engine failed to shut down properly. It's believed that exhaust would have quickly overwhelmed the submarine, poisoning the crew. The ongoing running of the engine would have also used up all available oxygen, dooming anyone who survived poisoning from the exhaust. It's not exactly clear how any of this happened, or why the submarine didn't immediately surface and evacuate its crew. 
It's important to remember that the Chinese military in the early 2000s was not particularly well known for its competency, and corruption was rampant, two legacies that continue to haunt the Chinese to this day. With senior officers on board who may not have been the best qualified for their position, it's possible that bad command helped fuel an unfolding crisis. China's remained extremely tight-lipped about the incident even in the two decades since, and it's rumored that the crew was all discovered dead at their posts, meaning asphyxiation happened relatively quickly. How this could have happened without some safety system alerting the crew shows just how bad shape the People's Liberation Army Navy was in at the time. Kursk Disaster, Russia, 2000 Stunning breaches of discipline, shoddy, obsolete, and poorly maintained equipment, negligence, incompetence, and mismanagement. So reads excerpts from the official Russian investigation into one of the worst submarine disasters in history, excerpts that shocked the world at the time, but wouldn't really surprise anyone observing Russia's current performance in Ukraine. The Kursk was designed with one role in mind, to take on and defeat an entire American carrier strike group all on its own. It was one of the biggest cruise missile submarines ever built, second only to America's Ohio class after a number of the class were converted to carry cruise missiles. Its Type 65 torpedo carried a 450-kilogram warhead, which could conceivably destroy or at least mission kill a carrier with just one hit. She was the pinnacle of Soviet submarine design, and a deadly threat even into the start of the new millennium. But she was also in service with the worst navy in the world. The Kursk had only undertaken a single deployment in her entire five-year career, spending six months monitoring the U.S. 6th Fleet as it responded to the war in Kosovo. With a collapsing post-Soviet economy, there was simply no room in the budget to buy fuel for her nuclear reactors, and some sailors in the Northern Fleet had even gone without pay. Needless to say, training, discipline, and basic standards were catastrophically low, and a lack of deployments meant her crew had little to no experience. All of these factors started to add up, and on her last deployment, accompanied by 118 Russian sailors, tragedy struck the Soviet sub. On August 12, 2000, the Kursk was participating in the first major naval exercise for the Russian fleet in 10 years, and the first since the fall of the Soviet Union. Russia was looking to remind the world that it was still a formidable superpower. The Kursk took center stage, the pride and joy of the Northern Fleet, with her crew having recently won a citation for excellent performance and recognized as the best submarine crew in the entire fleet. The bar must have been pretty low given the report that would follow the accident. Unlike other submarines, the Kursk was one of the few authorized to carry a full combat load at all times, including torpedoes, anti-submarine missiles, and the fearsome granite anti-ship missile. She also enjoyed the title of being unsinkable, with sailors claiming she could even withstand a direct hit from a torpedo, which really goes to show the quality of Russian sailors at the time. Baffling boasts aside, she was a state-of-the-art vessel for the Russian Navy, and a luxurious craft at that, with both the officers and enlisted enjoying the use of gymnasiums and even a spa inside a hull as long as two jumbo jets. At 8.51 in the morning, the Kursk requested permission to conduct a torpedo training launch using dummy torpedoes launched at the battlecruiser Peter Velikia. She received approval and at 11.29 am loaded the first practice torpedo into number 4 torpedo tube on the starboard side. 34 seconds later, the Norwegian Seismic Array and other seismic detectors around the world recorded a seismic event of a 1.5 magnitude on the Richter scale. The location was in the Barents Sea off the northern coast of Russia and near Norway, squarely on top of the Kursk's last known position. Two minutes and 14 seconds after the first event, a second event with the power of a small earthquake, measured in at 4.2 on the Richter scale and was registered on seismographs all across northern Europe. The event was detected as far away as Alaska, registered as an explosion with the equivalent power to 2-3 to three tons of TNT. The second explosion was logged as taking place at the same depth as the seabed, leaving little doubt as to what had occurred. The crew of the submarine Karelia had detected the two explosions, but the captain believed it was simply part of the ongoing exercise. The Peter Velikia, target of the Kursk's dummy torpedo attack, recorded the hydroacoustic signal of an underwater explosion and felt their own ship shudder from the immense force. They radioed the event back to fleet headquarters, but were naturally completely ignored because explosions massive enough to shake battle cruisers are apparently common in Russia. At 1.30 pm, the Kursk was expected to complete its fake attack run, but there was still no news from the submarine. With communications equipment along with everything else in a general state of disrepair, calm blackouts were not unexpected, and thus nobody was initially alarmed though the Peter Velikia did dispatch a helicopter to look for the sub. When the helicopter failed to find signs of the submarine, 
The Northern Fleet finally began to take the situation seriously. With a missing submarine and reports of two explosions in the training grounds, concern led to the alerting of the fleet's head of search and rescue forces. The primary rescue ship was a converted 20-year-old former lumber carrier equipped with two deep submergence rescue vehicles, a diving bell, lifting cranes, and other specialized gear. What it lacked, however, were stabilizers to keep the vessel in the right position in the rough seas, and thus it was only capable of carrying out rescue operations in calm waters. Due to budget woes, two India-class submarines equipped with deep submergence rescue vehicles were permanently held up in shipyards, awaiting repairs for the last six years. Search and rescue efforts, however, did not proceed until 6.30 p.m. after the Ilyushin IL-38 aircraft had failed to spot the submarine and the Kursk was now overdue for a scheduled communications check. At 10.30 p.m., the Northern Fleet declared an emergency as additional aircraft and ships failed to locate the Kursk anywhere on the surface and the exercise was stopped. At midnight, the sole operational rescue vessel in the fleet finally left port. Vladimir Putin, who had recently been elected to help destroy Russia, was not informed of the Kursk's disappearance until 7 a.m. the next day. The entire time, the Russian Navy continued to downplay the seriousness of the incident. But word was starting to spread across Russia and the international community both. Later that Sunday, the Northern Fleet commander continued to downplay the incident holding a press briefing to announce the results of the now-canceled exercise, stating the entire operation had been a resounding success. However, at Vidyevo Naval Base, a telephone operator overheard a conversation stating that a submarine was in serious trouble, eventually catching the Kursk's name. News from the small base soon reached the ears of family members, but they were assured by the deputy base commander that nothing out of the ordinary was occurring. On the same day that the Kursk had sunk, even before the Kremlin had been informed, the United States was already aware of the disaster and swiftly moved to inform its NATO allies. The United States, Britain, France, Germany, Israel, Italy, and Norway, many of which had vessels already near the accident site, all offered aid in rescuing possible survivors. But the Russian government refused, claiming that the rescue was well underway. The Russian Navy eventually held a press conference informing people of the disaster but claimed that rescue was imminent. It was not. A day after the sinking, one of the two rescue submersibles aboard the fleet's sole rescue vessel collided with the wreckage from the Kursk, slightly damaging the vehicle. The damaged rescue submersible was forced to rise, having confirmed the location of the Kursk's propeller and stern stabilizer, but not the submarine itself. The second submersible was prepared for operations and launched four hours later, at 10.40 p.m., but was given a wrong heading by the Peter Velekia and forced to resurface at 1 a.m. on Monday morning without having found the Kursk. The salvage tug Nikolai Chikyar managed to use deep water camera equipment to get images of the Kursk, showing severe damage to the bow and its sail, with the body of the submarine listing at 25 degrees. The bow had burrowed itself 22 meters into the seabed at a depth of 108 meters, well above the Kursk's crush depth. Its periscope was also discovered to still be raised, indicating that the accident had occurred while she was just 20 meters from the surface. The first rescue submersible was repaired and relaunched at 5 a.m. on Monday morning. Nearly two hours later, it located the Kursk and tried without success to attach to the aft escape trunk over the Kursk's ninth compartment. Since the sub was above crush depth and most of the damage was to the bow, there was good reason to hope that at least some of the crew had survived in the rearward watertight compartments. However, unable to create a vacuum seal with the escape trunk, the sub's batteries were quickly exhausted and it was forced to surface. With no spare batteries, the crew had to wait until the onboard batteries were recharged, but by that time, sea conditions had worsened and the Russians were unable to continue launching rescue operations. That morning, Monday, August 14th, the Russian Ministry of Defense made its first official announcement concerning the incident. It claimed that the submarine had, quote, descended to the ocean floor which was technically true. According to the Russian MOD, the crew had been forced to ground the submarine due to a mechanical breakdown, but air and power were being pumped to the submarine from the surface. This was at least 50% true, though the crew had had exactly zero choice in the immediate grounding of the Kursk. The MOD also claimed that they were in radio contact with the crew. The weather worsened considerably over the next two days, during which the Russians attempted to connect a diving bell to the sub twice and attach an ROV to the rescue hatch with no success. One of the rescue submersibles was launched again late on Tuesday night, but it was damaged as it struck a boom while being lowered into the turbulent waters and had to be brought back on board for repairs. It was relaunched over an hour later, but again failed to make contact with the sunken Kursk. That same day, now three days after the sinking, a crane ship with more advanced rescue submersibles finally arrived, 
but was unable to launch due to bad weather. The Russians instead moved closer to the coast and launched a rescue submersible there, then simply towed it to deeper water over the Kursk. At 12.20 a.m. on Wednesday morning, a rescue submersible attempted to attach to the ninth compartment escape hatch but again failed to create a seal. When it surfaced and was being lifted back onto the deck of its mothership, its propulsion system was seriously damaged, forcing the crew to cannibalize it for parts to repair one of the other submersibles. The rescue submersible being towed from the coast arrived shortly after, but also failed to latch onto one of the Kursk's escape hatches, while a storm on the surface damaged one of the rescue capsules still topside. Five days after the sinking, President Putin finally accepted British and Norwegian help. Six teams of British and Norwegian divers arrived on Friday, August 18th. The next day, a full week after the Kursk had been lost, a Norwegian ship with a British rescue submarine arrived on site. Russian naval officials placed restrictions on what parts of the submarine the Norwegian divers could work on, which significantly impeded their rescue efforts. Upon locating the air control valve on the exterior of the submarine, Russian experts warned the divers that they must open it counterclockwise or they would break it. With the valve not budging, the divers went against the Russians' advice and turned it in the opposite direction, immediately opening the valve. On Monday, the 21st of August, the rescue trunk was discovered to be full of water, dashing hopes of rescuing any crew. Using a custom tool to open the internal hatch leading to the rescue trunk, the divers released a large volume of air from inside of the ninth compartment, discovering multiple bodies. The Russian government finally admitted that the submarine was completely flooded and all crew had died, though again they were conveniently only telling half-truths. The discovery of the airtight compartment 9 indicated that a number of the crew had survived the initial disaster and sat on the bottom of the sea awaiting rescue that came far too late. Norwegian divers used specialized tools to cut holes in the hull of the submarine, but only Russian divers were allowed to enter the wreck itself, removing secret documents and discovering badly burned bodies, indicating that there had been a significant explosion. Twelve bodies were pulled from compartment 9, destroying the Russian government's official story that all aboard had died immediately upon the Kursk sinking. The official Russian story soon shifted to blaming a collision with a NATO submarine, or possibly a World War II naval mine, as the reason behind the Kursk disaster. Many Russian hardliners adopted the story of the collision with the NATO submarine, sent to spy on the exercise, but there was never any evidence given. An investigation panel was set up, but most of the members on it had a special interest directly staked to the outcome of the investigation, with no independent investigators being allowed onto the special board. Thus, the ultimate report was seen as not very credible. The official report blamed an explosion from the practice torpedo caused by a leak of its high-test peroxide fuel. The initial explosion destroyed the torpedo room and killed everyone in the first compartment, with a blast wave entering as far back as the fourth compartment. Everyone in the command post in the second compartment was immediately incapacitated by the blast entering via an air conditioning vent. The explosion caused a fire which set off the warheads on five to seven additional torpedoes, leading to the massive 4.2 Richter scale event detected around the world. However, the recovery of a partially burned set of safety instructions for the operation of the onboard torpedoes revealed that they were from a completely different type of torpedo altogether. The Russian Navy was discovered to have never inspected the Kursk crew's qualifications to handle and fire HTP torpedoes, and the crew, in fact, had no experience or training with this type of torpedo. Due to a lack of experience, bad or no training, and equally bad leadership, it's believed that the torpedo room crew themselves directly caused the initial explosion. More tragically, while most of the crew likely died, at least 24 had survived in the ninth compartment long after the submarine sunk. Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Kolesnikov had written a note listing the name of the 23 other sailors alive in the compartment after the Kursk sank. These men, however, all died when someone mishandled a cartridge of potassium superoxide used to power a chemical oxygen generator. These cartridges absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen in emergencies, but are highly reactive. Upon coming in contact with seawater, the cartridge immediately caused a flash fire which consumed all remaining oxygen in the compartment. Investigation of the wreckage showed that some of the men avoided the initial fire by diving underwater, but were forced to surface into an environment with no remaining oxygen and asphyxiated. For five days after the disaster, Vladimir Putin, who was only four months into his presidency, continued to enjoy his holiday at the presidential resort in Sochi on the Black Sea. As a result, Putin's approval ratings, which had been extremely high during his election bid, plummeted drastically. But democracy is an illusion in Russia anyway, so that doesn't really matter.
Sirens blare as valves purge air and two submarines descend into the depths of the ocean. Sailors sprint through the narrow corridors of the submersible, turning valves and reloading torpedoes into spent tubes. As the submarines dive deeper, the HMS Venturer releases a final barrage of torpedoes. They all miss, except one. Over the hydrophone, the sound of an explosion and the twisting of steel can be heard. The first and only underwater submarine battle is over. A mangled German U-boat sinks to the depths of the ocean. In 1944, the Germans launched Operation Caesar. It was a last-ditch effort to buy the Axis powers more time to turn the war around. They were in deep trouble as Allied forces closed in on all fronts. Germany hoped they could sneak advanced technology to Japan using a submarine classified as U-864. This would allow Japan to continue the fight in the Pacific, hopefully drawing Allied forces away from the collapsing Axis armies. The Nazis loaded advanced weapon designs such as schematics and parts for the Jumo-004 turbojet and guidance components for the V-2 ballistic missiles on the U-864. The U-boat was just under 300 feet long and designed to carry large cargo shipments long distances. The U-864 was also loaded with massive amounts of liquid mercury, which was used for manufacturing explosive primers. The crew was briefed on their mission. German and Japanese scientists were loaded onto the U-boat and on December 5, 1944, Captain Raoul Reimar Wolfram launched U-864 and proceeded toward the Arctic. His path was laid out to sneak past the Soviet Union undetected and deliver the cargo to Japan. But from the beginning, the mission seemed to be doomed. U-864 proceeded north. Allied forces patrolled most of the waters in the area, so Wolfram knew he needed to travel as stealthy as possible. To do this, he would need to take risks and move into more dangerous waters. In order to have Axis protection for as long as possible, U-864 sailed along the coast of northern Europe where air support remained in range. As the U-boat made its way through the shallow waters, disaster struck. Wolfram grounded the sub while trying to pass through the Kiel Canal. The jagged rocks tore the hull of the submarine. The crew had to assess the damage, and once inventory was taken, Wolfram had no choice but to turn the sub around and return to dry dock for repairs. The treacherous journey around the Arctic would require everything to be working perfectly, and until the U-boat was repaired, it had no shot of making it all the way to Japan. U-864 stealthily made its way to Bergen, Norway, which was still controlled by Axis powers. As the sub was being repaired, Allied forces launched a bombing run into Norway. They weren't aiming for U-864, but the dry dock where the U-boat was being repaired was a target. The British planes roared over the Axis base. Anti-aircraft guns fired their cannons into the sky, trying to take out the bombers before they could drop their payloads. Most of the bombers made it to their target and dropped a series of Tall Boy and Grand Slam earthquake bombs around the dry dock. The bombs were specifically designed to penetrate the surface and detonate below ground to send the explosions full force through the bedrock. The result was the destruction of underground structures like submarine pens and bunkers. Unfortunately for U-864, it was in the submarine pen when the detonations occurred, causing even more damage to the U-boat. This led to further delays in Operation Caesar and the mission to deliver the cargo to Japan. The numerous delays for repairs would culminate in the only underwater submarine battle in history. Unknown to the Germans, the British had cracked their codes. The Allies intercepted a communication about U-864's mission and knew they couldn't let the Nazi sub make it to Japan. They immediately dispatched the HMS Venturer to destroy the U-boat. The Venturer was almost twice as fast as the bulky U-864, but it was also much smaller. It had a limited crew and could fire four torpedoes at once, but only held a relatively small number of torpedoes on board compared to U-864's arsenal of 22 torpedoes. This meant that the Venturer needed to make every shot count. The Venturer left for its mission under the command of Lt. James S. Launders on February 6, 1945. The plan was to intercept U-864 off the coast of Norway. Launders had sunk 13 vessels during the war, including a German submarine that had surfaced. The problem that Launders faced now was finding the exact location of U-864. He knew the general vicinity, but the vastness of the ocean and the technological challenges of locating a submerged submarine without giving his position away made his mission incredibly difficult. The main method the Venturer had to locate U-864 was the use of hydrophones. This device could listen for sounds of enemy submarines underwater, however it was only effective at a limited range and there was a lot of ocean to cover. The other way the Venturer could locate an enemy submarine was through active sonar, by sending out an acoustic wave and waiting for it to bounce off an enemy sub. The location of the vessel could be obtained. However, the problem with active sonar was that it also alerted the enemy to the location of the Venturer. The Venturer reached the coordinates where U-864 was supposed to be located. They scoured the area for any signs of the German U-boat but came up empty. Unfortunately for the Venturer, U-864 had already passed through their location and was now out of range of the hydrophones aboard the British submarine. Launders had missed his chance. 
the Nazi U-boat was on its way to Japan. However, U-864's bad luck was not over yet. The U-boat's diesel engine began to misfire, causing the vessel to slow down. Wolfram was forced to make another difficult decision. Either he pressed forward, which was a huge risk, or returned to dry dock for additional repairs. Again, Wolfram knew the journey through the Arctic would be brutal, and if anything happened to the engine while in the icy cold region, he and his entire crew would perish. So Wolfram decided to turn around and head back to Norway. Wolfram had no way of knowing he was headed right into the Venturer's trap. It was only out of sheer bad luck that the failing diesel engine aboard the U-864 caused the U-boat to turn around and head straight toward Launders and his vessel. The crew of the Venturer were monitoring the area, even though they had almost completely given up hope of ever locating the German U-boat. Then, one of the crew picked up something on the hydrophones. It was the misfiring diesel engine of the U-864. The alarm was sounded and the crew prepared for the chase. The Venturer stealthily moved toward the sound of the misfiring engine of the U-864. Then Launders saw what he suspected was the periscope or snorkel mast sticking out of the water. The snorkel mast allowed submarines to travel just under the surface of the ocean and still pump the oxygen the diesel engine needed into the vessel. The Venturer had located its target. The diesel engines were turned off so the sub could run silently underwater on battery power. Launders waited for the U-boat to surface so he could take his shot. Unfortunately, U-864 could stay just below the surface of the water using its snorkel for the duration of its journey back to port. Then the U-boat did something strange. It began zigzagging from side to side. Launders knew the Germans must have either suspected they were being pursued or had already detected his submarine. The chase continued for hours. U-864 refused to surface and began taking even more drastic evasive actions. This alerted Launders that the Germans were now fully aware that they were being followed. The Venturer's batteries were running low, and the submarine would soon need to surface itself, which would leave it vulnerable to attack by the German U-boat. Launders gave the command to arm all torpedoes. The captain calculated the trajectory and depth of the U-boat with the limited data he had. The order to fire blared across the speakers of the torpedo base. The Venturer Ripple fired four torpedoes, with each being launched just about 18 seconds apart. The second two torpedoes were fired at a lower depth just in case the enemy dove deeper. Launders ordered the Venturer to immediately dive in case of a counterattack. As the sub descended into the blackness of the ocean, the crew waited with anticipation. Time seemed to freeze as everyone on the Venturer held their breath, waiting for the hydrofoam operator to confirm a hit. There was no explosion. It seemed as if all the torpedoes had missed. Hope began to leave the crew of the Venturer. Then suddenly, the hydrofoam operator perked up. The sound of an impact, explosion, and the tearing apart of iron could be heard over the headset. U-864's hull ripped open and the entire vessel collapsed in on itself from the massive pressure of the ocean. The last torpedo fired had found its target. The hydrophone operator waited patiently until he heard the enemy U-boat thud against the bottom of the seafloor. All 74 people on board U-864 were lost to the ocean. The Axis powers' hopes of delivering weapons and materials to Japan sank with the German submarine. The site of the wreck remained undisturbed for over 50 years until the Norwegian Navy located it. U-864 was lying in a crumpled heap on the bottom of the ocean, but its cargo of mercury was leaking out of the vessel and into the water. Also, the U-boat had unexploded ordnance within its hull. In order to stop the leak and prevent any accidental explosions, the Norwegian authorities decided to cover the wreck under 160,000 tons of sand and rock. The battle between U-864 and the Venturer was the only underwater submarine battle in history. But why? Submarines had been used as far back as 1776 during the American Revolutionary War with the submersible known as Turtle. How is it possible that there was only one underwater submarine battle? There are a few reasons. World War II was the height of submarine warfare. After the war ended, submarines were still used, but normally only for moving cargo and as support. During World War II, submarines needed to spend most of their time on the surface, so their diesel engines could get the air they needed. This meant that submarine warfare often took place on the surface and not underwater. Also, before and during World War II, when submarines were underwater, there was no accurate way to gauge exactly where the enemy was in three-dimensional space. Lastly, torpedoes at the time were designed to float up to the surface to strike ships, so firing a torpedo at an underwater target was not ideal. This is not to say that other submarine engagements didn't occur, just that underwater battles were incredibly rare because of these limitations. Today, submarines are equipped with radar and guided torpedoes that would make underwater battles possible but no wars are currently being fought under the waves of the ocean. This all shows that what the Venturer did by destroying U-864 underwater was incredibly impressive. It also happened due to a considerable amount of luck. 
the torpedoes fired by the Venturer were more or less shot blindly into the ocean abyss, and the fact that one of them impacted U-864 was nothing short of a miracle. Just off the coast of California, a hunt is underway. American cruisers and the USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier ply the deep Pacific waters, and underneath, a Los Angeles-class nuclear attack sub prowls for its quarry. Overhead, anti-submarine warfare helicopters buzz around the carrier battle group, routinely stopping to dip their hanging sonar into the water and listen for the sub everyone is hunting for. Poseidon aircraft fly overhead, their powerful magnetic anomaly sensors scouring the sea beneath the big planes. Thousands of eyes are glued to electronic screens or scouring the sea with binoculars. Just three miles away from the mighty USS Ronald Reagan, a slender periscope breaks the surface. It snaps four photos of the big aircraft carrier and then sinks once more beneath the waves. Its mission has been achieved. The tiny Swedish submarine has successfully penetrated all the various layers of American anti-submarine defense and scored a simulated hit on the Ronald Reagan. This war game occurred in 2005, after the US Navy struck a deal with Sweden to lease the submarine and her crew for participation in major anti-submarine warfare war games. If the scenario had been a real wartime condition, the small Gotland-class submarine would have definitely scored hits on the Ronald Reagan, though with her relatively small torpedoes and limited number of launch tubes, it's unlikely the massive Reagan would have been sunk or even declared a mission kill. Still, when you're operating the world's largest supercarriers and each carrier is home to more firepower than many countries' entire air forces, you don't want to be taking unnecessary risks. The bigger question, however, is how did this small Swedish sub even manage to penetrate through the many rings of security supposed to protect the most powerful warships in the world? Immediately after the end of World War II, a fierce debate over the future of American firepower erupted at the highest levels of military leadership. The US Navy insisted that big aircraft carriers were the best tools for projecting American firepower, while the newly created Air Force insisted that its B-36 long-range bomber program was in fact the best fit. After many hearings, Congress eventually sided with the Air Force, and a planned expansion of aircraft carriers was canceled. However, during the Korean War, the close air support made available by aircraft carrier assets convinced the country that aircraft carriers were indeed a critical way of projecting power forward, and a new emphasis on their construction began. As the Cold War evolved, the Soviet Union greatly feared the growing threat of American carriers. Once the US developed nuclear weapons small enough to be equipped by carrier-based planes, those fears were intensified. This led them to aggressively pursue the use of nuclear submarines in order to hunt and kill American carriers in the event of war. The US was well aware of this threat, and its intelligence on Soviet subs was far better than the Soviet Union ever truly knew. Thus, America quickly developed the most robust anti-submarine warfare capability in the world, and the US was so confident it could defeat Soviet subs that aircraft carriers played prominent roles in war plan offensives against the Soviet Union. When the Cold War ended though, the US Navy found itself armed to the teeth for a war that never came, and with no significant opponent that could match the level of readiness that the Soviet Union had forced the US Navy to maintain. China was a growing problem, but its navy was and remains today decades behind the capabilities of the US, and its own submarines are so notoriously loud that sonar operators have described Chinese subs as washing machines being dragged behind a pickup truck down a gravel road. With no significant threat to American carriers, the US anti-submarine warfare capabilities began to atrophy, and this only worsened with the retirement of the S-3 Viking patrol aircraft and the Oliver Hazard Perry class of frigates, both key tools in the Cold War Navy's anti-submarine warfare toolkit. To make matters worse, the launch of the dual wars in Iraq and Afghanistan saw the Navy shift its focus from blue water naval operations to coastal support roles, lending their surface and undersea firepower to land units in need of fire support. Budgets and technology were invested in giving Navy vessels improved ability to target and destroy land targets, and better support ongoing shore-based operations. Under the waves, though, the American subfleet was being slowly neglected, and it wouldn't be until President Obama's second term that a big investment in submarine purchases would see a growing gap in available vessels finally start to shrink. By 2005, it was growing increasingly obvious that China wasn't content to let the current balance of power in the South Pacific rest as it had for decades, and its aggressive and illegal seizure of maritime territory belonging to its neighbors proved to the US that China could very quickly become the US Navy's public enemy number one. While Chinese submarines were decades behind in stealth technology, many international shipbuilders were starting to produce new modes of diesel-electric submarines that could threaten America's big carriers. Despite these 
threats, the US Navy had allowed its anti-submarine warfare capabilities to atrophy to disastrous levels. It was time to make a change. First though, the US Navy had to determine what kind of a threat these new air-independent diesel-electric submarines posed to modern carriers. A relatively new development, air-independent diesel-electric subs bridged the endurance gap between nuclear submarines and traditional diesel subs. Nuclear submarines are notoriously difficult to run silently, and the US Navy has spent billions on research into quieting the many very noisy systems that keep a nuclear reactor running smoothly. The constant need for water as a coolant to be pumped into the reactor for for instance, is one hurdle that the US Navy has long cleared, but navies such as Russia's own never quite did. China, for all intents and purposes, never even made it out of the starting block in this regard. By comparison though, a diesel electric submarine runs perfectly silent when it's underwater. That's because these subs use air-breathing diesel engines while on the surface of the ocean to charge massive banks of batteries, and then turn their engines off and cruise the depths on battery power alone, completely eliminating all the potential noise of a nuclear sub. Yet this ability comes with the obvious drawback that a diesel sub will very quickly have to resurface in order to run its engines and replenish its batteries. And this has traditionally limited the endurance of diesel subs to just days. A new development in diesel submarines, though, has resulted in what's known as air-independent propulsion systems, in which the diesel engines can still be run even while underwater. Typically, liquid oxygen is mixed with an inert gas and pumped into the engines so that they can burn the diesel as fuel, and then waste gases are vented into the ocean. Thus, this new generation of diesel subs can recharge their batteries while underwater and not give themselves away by having to resurface every two to three days. An AIP diesel sub can have an endurance of up to two weeks, which is far and away better than any other diesel submarine to date. This increased endurance has made diesel submarines a threat to ships operating in deep waters, as in the past there was little threat from diesel subs getting anywhere near the depths that an aircraft carrier might operate from, as they simply didn't have the endurance. Now, AIP diesel subs offer a cheap alternative to nations wishing to build a fleet capable of striking in deep waters with an AIP diesel sub running anywhere from $100 to $500 million, or about a quarter the price of a nuclear submarine. In 2005, the US got to see for itself just how effective these small lethal boats were, and though details of the war games remain classified, it's rumored that the Gotland and its Swedish crew managed to score many hits and even some kills on US vessels during the one year it was on lease to the US. In fact, the United States went so far as to lease the sub and its crew for an additional year as it carefully studied the capabilities of the sub and developed strategies to defeat this new generation of quiet, stealthy diesel electric subs. The result of the two years of war games was an increased focus on America's seriously flagging anti-submarine warfare capabilities and the development of new tools such as autonomous sub-hunting drone ships now in active duty service. With the threat of a possible conflict with China in the South China Sea, the US Navy is no longer taking any chances in the realm of undersea warfare, and its traditional edge on anti-submarine warfare is once more being honed. Yet, just how vulnerable are big ships such as modern supercarriers to this new generation of small, stealthy diesel-electric subs? Well, even the best-equipped navy in the world is going to have trouble dealing with submarines. It's notoriously difficult to locate and track submarines beneath the waves, and thus the best defense that a modern carrier has is to simply stay on the move at all times. An American supercarrier has a cruising speed of about 35 knots, which is approximately the top speed of most submarines. By staying on the move, a sub will have a very difficult time getting close enough to get a firing solution, or will have to burn up its fuel or energy reserves in order to keep up. For a nuclear-powered sub, this isn't a problem, but for a diesel-electric submarine this poses a huge issue, and is the reason why the US Navy has always opted for nuclear power. Yet, a diesel-electric sub such as Sweden's Gotland doesn't have to catch up with a carrier if it can instead simply wait in the direct path. This might be tough for a country with a small submarine fleet such as Sweden to do in a real war, as aircraft carriers routinely make abrupt course adjustments for just this reason. Yet a large enough group of submarines could potentially spread out over enough area that the big carrier will eventually be moving in one of their directions. With its engines powered off and resting still and silent, a submarine is practically undetectable and it can simply sit still and wait until it has a firing solution on the approaching carrier, fire off its torpedoes, and then quickly make its escape. 
Smaller submarines such as the Gotland and its limited number of torpedo tubes and smaller warheads are unlikely to destroy a big supercarrier, as they would be detected immediately upon opening fire and sunk themselves in return if they didn't flee as soon as they launched their opening volley. Yet, larger diesel electric subs can carry more torpedo tubes with larger warheads, and these pose a significant threat to big surface ships. Not impossible to detect or defend from by any means, small, cheap diesel electric submarines nevertheless pose a significant threat to any surface ship, and especially so when a navy has allowed its anti-submarine warfare training and capabilities both to atrophy. Just after midnight on February 24, 1968, a submarine set out from a major Soviet naval base near the city of Petropavlovsk on Russia's far eastern Kamchatka Peninsula. The Cold War had been playing out for years in Vietnam in the form of a grinding proxy struggle, as well as in the frozen conflict in Korea. Now, officials both in the United States and the Soviet Union feared the situation was in danger of descending into a direct conflict between the superpowers. The Soviet-allied North Koreans had captured a U.S. spy ship. In the context of this crisis, a Soviet submarine K-129 received orders to head out early for a mission in the North Pacific, its third in quick succession. The K-129 carried three missiles capable of delivering a nuclear payload well over 700 miles and had been in service since 1960. Powered by a diesel engine, she belonged to the 629A class of submarines, known to the US as Gulf II. Gulf subs weren't at the cutting edge of Soviet technology but were still important assets in their arsenal. With an extra large complement of 98 officers and sailors packed on board, this patrol was scheduled to continue through May 5, making a distant approach to American waters far northwest of Hawaii. But on March 8, the Soviet base failed to receive a planned radio transmission from the sub. The following day, the Soviet Navy began sending out a flotilla of subs, other ships, and planes to search for the lost vessel. But with as much as a million square miles of ocean to search, they were unable to even locate a wreck. Months later, the Soviet government would inform the families of the crew aboard the K-129 that they were presumed dead. Because the Soviet command had made no attempt to disguise the major deployment of so many warships, the US Navy immediately became aware of the operation, if not its purpose. But the Americans also had something called the Sound Surveillance System, or SOSUS, a network of advanced audio receiving equipment in the Pacific, and they'd registered an explosion on March 11th. So they were able to surmise that their adversaries were searching for a lost and now sunken vessel. Not only that, they were able to locate the site of the explosion to within six miles. The Soviets were hundreds of miles off in their search party, and US intelligence could examine the site without the risk of immediate interference. To take advantage of this opportunity, in what was called Operation Sand Dollar, the US Navy sent a specially equipped spy submarine, the USS Halibut, for reconnaissance. Among the photos it captured were unmistakable images of a wrecked sub on the deep ocean floor. CIA officials realized that if the US could access the Soviet submarine, the intelligence would be invaluable. But what they were suggesting was the single biggest technological challenge in their organization's history, and one of the most ambitious intelligence operations in history, period. The K-129 was resting at some 16,000 feet, nearly three miles beneath the ocean surface. At such a depth, the pressure is crushing. Ordinary submarines would never dive anywhere near that. Moreover, the heaviest object ever lifted from a comparable depth weighed 50 tons. They were proposing the recovery of an object that weighed 1,500 tons, and they would have to perform the incredible lift with complete secrecy. If Soviet intelligence discovered the mission, international law would shut it down, and in the Cold War, legal battle was hardly the biggest conflict that could develop between the two nations. The CIA might seem an unusual branch of government to carry out a naval mission. You might, for instance, think about using the Navy. There were people in naval intelligence who were not pleased to take a supporting role in what they considered to be their natural territory. But by now, the CIA had for several years demonstrated the ability to develop advanced technology on the fly, employing engineers as contractors in secret projects with minimal organizational friction. So began Project Azorian named for the Azores Islands in the Atlantic Ocean for no particular reason. CIA codenames were essentially arbitrary. Still, this was really a new scale of research and development. The technology to lift a heavy object from the bottom of the ocean did not exist. Even mining and drilling in deep water were considered a considerable challenge. But that fact actually helped to provide the mission with its cover. The story would actually be another major project of naval engineering, building a ship-based deep ocean mining rig. 
there would be some overlap in the equipment needed and the building of a huge recovery ship impossible to hide would make perfect sense. If all went well, Soviet spies wouldn't even think to look for a military or intelligence component to the civilian industrial product. In 1970, the company Global Marine was the leader in development and operation of deep sea mining equipment. They had that year successfully tested complex manipulation of seafloor drilling equipment with their ship the Glomar Challenger. Funding the research would present two challenges. First, the expensive project of course had to be given the green light from the highest levels, but there also had to be some explanation for the funding of the extensive development. To that end, the eccentric and private billionaire Howard Hughes lent his name as the mining operations investor of record, forming a shell corporation called SUMA to hide the money for Project Azorian. Hughes had assisted with intelligence gathering in the past, and in addition to being a plausible funder, his inaccessibility meant he wasn't likely to be a security risk. He may not even have known or cared exactly what the real operation was, but his name added a kind of luster to the cover story, which received some interest from the press. The Hughes Global Marine Venture would be the development of equipment that could gather nodules of manganese and other minerals that accumulated around sediment on the ocean floor. In principle, it seemed like it could be a profitable enterprise, and since no one had ever tried it before, there was no hard evidence to the contrary. Early on, the CIA team rejected exotic ideas like extracting hydrogen from the water around the wreck to create a balloon that would lift the sub. Instead, they would use what was called a string, actually a series of steel pipes, to lower a remote-operated capture vehicle with a claw to the ocean floor. The vehicle would have a detachable complement of legs as a kind of lander, which would allow leverage to initiate the tremendous lift without the risk of sinking into the seafloor if it proved semi-fluid. The legs would then detach and the string would be pulled up one segment at a time. The ship itself, the Glomar Explorer, would have a giant hidden moon pool in its hull that could accommodate the submarine, which measured over 320 feet in length. Pulling the wreck to the surface required that the vehicle remain virtually stationary in the water, and so the Explorer was outfitted with a complex gimbal system that allowed continual adjustment in the effective center of mass for the huge ship. But there was also also the matter of the nuclear weapons. The recovery crew would have to treat the entire wreck as contaminated because the material within the warheads would have by then leaked onto everything. Plus, there were nuclear-tipped torpedoes, but the payoff would be an inside look at the Soviet nuclear weapons program, in addition to all of the technology of the submarine itself. Even more valuable would be insights into the Soviet Union's communication systems, specifically their coded communications. Provisions were made to try to salvage waterlogged paper to preserve the K-129's codebooks and other records. By 1974, the undertaking had overcome all the engineering obstacles, at least they hoped, not to mention calls from some who were in the loop to call off the project that was costing hundreds of millions of dollars, with a dubious chance of success. The ship was its own prototype. The team could do testing closer to shore, and did, off California's Santa Catalina Island. But the whole thing was designed for one mission, and likely they'd only get one try. Once the Explorer was in place, about 1,500 miles west of Hawaii, with sophisticated, essentially experimental equipment, it took longer than planned to get everything running properly for a retrieval attempt. There was an inkling of what the Americans were up to, but the CIA mission had apparently managed to keep intel out of the hands of any foreign agent, and the task itself seemed impossible, so it was reasonable for the Kremlin to brush aside fears that the US might recover the K-129. Still, while the recovery team were in position, the Soviets took notice and sent a surveillance mission in what looked like a civilian vessel to contact the Explorer. They exchanged messages in Russian, and the command on the Soviet ship bought the cover story. This was, they determined, what it looked like, an experimental mining expedition. Still, not everyone in the Soviet military brass was convinced, and later a tugboat arrived with much the same purpose. The interaction the second time was, in a way, both more confrontational and less harried for the recovery team. With the tugboat in close visual range of the Explorer, the Soviet sailors mooned the American rig workers who responded in kind, after which the enemy tugboat departed. This was not the peak of tension in the Cold War. When all of the components of the ship were ready, the crew of the Explorer began lowering the recovery vehicle Clementine nearly three miles to their target, one steel pipe section at a time. The lander arrived above the hull of the sunken submarine, and the arms of the recovery craft closed and took hold. Up at the other end of the video feed, remote steering of the robotic vessel took great skill and cool nerves. 
Once the arms were in place, the remote pilot began the incredible feat of lifting the enormous payload from the seafloor with the force of the lander's legs. Fortunately, the ocean bottom was quite solid, preserving more lifting power than a fluid base would allow. Once the sub was safely suspended in the water, the legs were detached and the rest of the power to pull would come from the string. As sections of the pipe were removed from the string, the cumulative weight dropped significantly, reducing the force needed to pull each time. But part way up, two of Clementine's claws broke, and the submarine they held snapped. Most of the K-129 broke away and fell back to the seafloor, although a chunk was still in her grasp. The recovery team had to relay this news back to Langley. The first reaction from the home office was to abort and try again, but the engineers of the Glomar Explorer knew that if they stopped and reset, they were likely to come back completely empty-handed. Even a partial success had been far from assured. In the end, their boss at the CIA relented and let the team continue with the lift. At last, a portion of the submarine rose up and into the moon pool. Everyone intended to make necessary repairs and adjustments to the equipment and return to the site the next time ocean conditions were favorable, the following summer. The missiles and most of the sub remained unrecovered, but a second expedition would never happen. The Soviet Union may never have learned the extent of Project Azorian, but journalists in the US were picking up clues to the story. Eventually, the Los Angeles Times received a tip with enough details to report on the real mission behind Project Jennifer, and a popular radio commentator broadcast an opinion piece on the story. Whatever the American public may have thought about the funding of CIA black ops was irrelevant though, since a return trip would have required the same secrecy as the first. Workers now suited up to handle the wreckage laced with nuclear waste. There would be no missiles in this section, but the presumption was that the radioactive material would be everywhere. Additionally, there were nuclear-tipped torpedoes in the recovered portion. As the crew bagged equipment that might have value for American intelligence, they also found the remains of six sailors from the K-129's last unfortunate voyage. Orders were to treat all human remains, including fragments, with respect and dignity. Before the Glomar Explorer returned to port, the sailors received a burial at sea with military honors, with both the Soviet naval flag and the American flag on display, and both of the nation's anthems played. The ceremony was videotaped, and years later, when the Cold War adversaries had awakened from their decades-long nightmare, a later CIA director would present the naval flag and the video to Boris Yeltsin first president of the newly established Russian Federation. The final price tag for Project Azorian was $350 million. It took longer to plan than the early space missions and coincided with the Nixon era, when American confidence in the government in general was low, and the illegal abuse of secrecy was rampant. Like the space program, it did offer some spin-off technology. Almost as an afterthought, it made major advances in the field of deep ocean drilling, and the Glomar Explorer would later serve a function similar to its cover story. The requirements of detente with the Soviet Union necessitated a calculated silence about the program, since an acknowledgement by the Americans would embarrass their adversaries, unhelpful in strategic negotiations. In fact, it was in response to Freedom of Information Act requests about the project that the CIA developed its so-called Glomar response, that it would neither confirm nor deny a matter in question. But parts of the project were declassified in 2010, following the release of Michael White's 2009 documentary Azorian, The Race of the K-129. Josh Dean's The Taking of K-129, published in 2017, provides most of the details of our coverage, but the exact extent of the intelligence that was gleaned from the K-129 remains a secret. On January 23, 1960, the Trieste touched down on the sandy soil at the bottom of Challenger Deep, the deepest part of the Mariana Trench and deepest point in the world. At a depth of 35,815 feet, the Trieste withstood an incredible 1.25 metric tons per square centimeter of pressure, although the single plexiglass window had cracked on the way down, giving American Don Walsh and Frenchman Jacques Picard a good scare. Yet the Trieste was not a submarine, but rather a bathyscaphe specifically designed to withstand the tremendous pressure. In today's episode of the Infographic Show, we ask, how deep can submarines go? It's said we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the bottom of our own oceans. And the reason why may have a lot to do with how incredibly difficult it is to visit the deepest depths. As a submarine slips beneath the waves, the weight of the water above it presses down on its hull. The deeper you go, the more water above you and the greater the pressure 
launcher on your submarine. Bathysphere or bathyscaphs, such as the Trieste, are able to dive to much deeper depths than a submarine because they are spherical as opposed to the cylinder design of a submarine. A sphere is better able to resist pressure because it takes advantage of its arch-like construction, something discovered by the ancient Romans who used arches extensively in their grand architecture. As force presses down on the arched top half of a bathysphere, the pressure is distributed equally across the entire sphere. A cylinder, on the other hand, does take advantage of some of the arch-like characteristics of a bathysphere, but aren't as effective in spreading out the pressure exerted on them as a completely rounded sphere. For utility reasons, submarines also must be designed differently so they can hold crew, equipment, and weapons, while a bathysphere is typically limited to only a few square feet of space. The Trieste, for example, housed her crew in only seven square feet of living space, making for an incredibly cramped four and a half hour ride to the bottom of the ocean. Submarines are thus far more limited in their cruising depths than a specially built bathysphere, and each submarine has different depth ratings. Oxygen becomes toxic at higher pressures, and humans can suffer extreme physiological effects from high air pressure. As oxygen becomes pressurized, it forms large amounts of superoxide anion and peroxide, which are highly toxic to living cells. While the human body secretes multiple enzymes to protect itself from these effects, under high pressure, the production of these highly reactive species overwhelms a cell's ability to protect itself, destroying the cell. Prolonged exposure to high pressure oxygen can lead to dizziness, convulsions, and eventually death. Nitrogen, too, becomes highly toxic to humans at high pressures, inducing nitrogen narcosis, or rapture of the deep, which produces a drunken-like state in the victim. Some divers suffering from nitrogen narcosis have died from willingly removing their scuba equipment in their confused state. To protect its crew, a submarine must therefore be able to keep the air inside at a relatively normal pressure, which then creates a massive pressure difference between the inside and outside that its hull must resist. Given operational concerns such as stealthiness and the necessity to effectively engage in combat, submarines are therefore far more limited in their diving ranges than a bathysphere. Typically, each submarine has a design depth which is calculated by engineers who take into account materials available and any new technological developments in manufacturing. From there, the ship's designers calculate how thick the hull must be. A sub's test depth is generally set at two-thirds design depth for US submarines and four-sevenths design depth for the British Royal Navy and is the maximum depth at which a submarine is is allowed to operate during peacetime. Operating depth, or never exceed depth, is the maximum depth a submarine is allowed to operate under any conditions to include battle. Crush depth, or collapse depth, is exactly what it sounds like, the depth at which a submarine's hull is expected to crush. So how deep can a submarine actually go? In response to a revelation via their spying network that the United States could easily track all of its very noisy submarines, the Soviet Union launched the Akula-class submarine in the mid-1980s, an absolute monster of a sub 362 feet long with a beam of 45 feet wide. While the full capabilities of a military submarine are kept secret, it was known that the Akula III's test depth was 1,710 feet, with a maximum operating depth of 2,000 feet. In response, the US created the Seawolf class, which, while smaller than the Akula, featured significantly better performance than either its nemesis or the Los Angeles class subs that it was supposed to replace. Featuring a hull two inches thick made of steel 20% stronger than that used in the Los Angeles class, a Seawolf's crush depth was estimated to be between 24 400 and 3,000 feet. However, in the mid-2000s, the USS Jimmy Carter was modified to support clandestine operations, adding an extra 100-foot section of hull to support the launching and recovery of unmanned vehicles and up to 50 SEALs. The modifications also featured auxiliary maneuvering water jets for precise maneuvering when tapping undersea cables. Given that undersea cables can run to some pretty extreme depths, the true crush depth of a US Seawolf submarine is likely well over 3,000 feet and will remain remain highly classified. Civilian submarines, however, have dived to much deeper depths. The Alvin class of submarines were made famous as the original model explored the wreckage of the Titanic in 1986. On a secret mission for the US Navy to find and map the wreckage of two lost subs, maritime explorer Robert Ballard was granted last-minute permission to attempt to find the wreck of the doomed passenger ship. After a week of fruitless searching, the Titanic was finally discovered at a depth of 2.37 miles beneath the 
surface. Diving down in his Alvin submersible and accompanied by a remotely operated vehicle, Ballard took many pictures of the famous wreck and in the years since, other missions to the ship have been successful to include a dozen dives by American director James Cameron. Small submersibles far exceed the maximum depths of larger military submarines because they don't have to hold as many crew members and can thus take advantage of stronger spherical designs. While modern submersibles may even be capable of reaching the depths of Challenger Deep, none have tried since the famous expedition of the Trieste Bathyscaphe. Yet today, surprisingly enough, it's NASA that is interested in very deep diving submersibles. After the discovery of liquid water on Titan, NASA has begun testing designs for a sub capable of diving in the methane-infused water. Yet unlike on Earth, this submarine will need to withstand extreme cold temperatures of around negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit and greater pressures than regular seawater. Yet lurking beneath the frigid waters of Titan, NASA thinks might be black smokers, volcanic vents like those that litter the surface of our own ocean and our havens for deep sea life. Now watch what would happen if China and the US went to war hour by hour. Or check out this video instead.